You're about to travel to a place of wonder, excitement, and discovery. If those words just gave you some nostalgic chills, you are in for a treat with this episode. And if you did not recognize these words, you might now find a secret history of Christian discipleship through a fantastical drama you never knew about. Today, we are exploring a top-tier, formative, Christian-made audio adventure series full of fantasy, sci-fi, time travel, mystery, romance, spy thriller, and a small town with big personalities that has been delighting and teaching generations of fans since 1987. Joining us on this journey is none other than this fiction franchise's co-creator himself, Phil Lawler. Welcome to Adventures in Odyssey for episode 100 of Fantastical Truth. Greetings anew and welcome to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from Lorehaven, where we explore fantastical stories for God's glory and apply their meanings to the real world that Jesus calls us to serve. I'm E. Steber Burnett, publisher of Lorehaven and also the co-author of the nonfiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parents. And I'm Zachary Russell. And as much as I like to think of myself as Mr. Whitaker, deep down, I know because I look in the mirror every day, I'm probably a lot more like Eugene. And this is episode 100, What If You Traveled to a Place of Wonder, Excitement, and Discovery? And we are going to be talking about Adventures in Odyssey with creator Phil Lawler. Phil is the founding father of Adventures in Odyssey, co-created way back in the late 80s with another guy named Steve Harris. And it was our privilege to speak with him for a very long discussion that you're going to get to enjoy in just a little bit. If you're listening to this episode on release day, it is Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to 22 2022 february 22nd of 2022 that has new meaning for adventures and odyssey it's just a fun coincidence that our uh, now episode 100 gets to release on that day i posted about this episode uh, last week uh, before we released it and a lot of people said odyssey my childhood my response to them now is odyssey my adulthood if you yeah, it's mine <laughs> if too. you haven't heard <laughs> this show in a while Go back and listen. I think you will find that so many of those episodes have aged magnificently. And we get into that with Phil. Uh, this is a very fan-friendly episode for Adventures and Odyssey fans, no matter your age. Kids should be able to listen to it, although you may get a lot of trivia about the behind the scenes of the show. Folks who are teenagers, young adults, and even older adults now uh, should find this enjoyable. I would consider myself in that uh, latter category. I still keep up with Adventures in Odyssey, having returned to the franchise after a break. Probably a few years ago, I discovered that they had this streaming app, uh, the Adventures in Odyssey Club. I got that and managed to binge every single episode. Imagine it. Oh, my 10-year-old self having like all 800 all of them? Wow. Adventures in Odyssey episodes in my pocket, <laughs> including the ones that have been decanonized or that the creators just felt were too embarrassing. It's all there. Even the controversial ones with the goofy police officer, everything is at the Adventures in Odyssey Club, and you can go subscribe to that. As we also mentioned in our discussion, uh, by the time you listen to this, by the way, I may have uh, my repurposed article about Adventures in Odyssey and my returning to the fandom uh, published at Lorehaven. Now, that should be available uh, the week of this episode's release. Well, this is going to be so fun, Stephen, because uh, I didn't know Adventures in Odyssey at all when I was a kid, and I only found out about it through our kids. I, I think someone gave them a CD at one point with a couple episodes, and then they got a few more, and then we found out there was an app, and then we, we purposed some old iPhones so our kids could listen to it whenever they want, when they're doing chores, when they're going to bed. And uh, it's been fantastic. I, we, we hear quotes of these stories all the time. You know, we, we quote them back and forth to each other. It's going to be so fun to get to talk to the person that's uh, behind all this. Before we do that, and before we get to uh, kind of a strange explanation I have for my technical glitch in our last episode, let's go to sponsor one for this episode. Uh, once again, it is The Gatekeeper's Descendants, a fantasy novel from Johanna Frank. Here's the back cover description. Every choice he makes complicates his life. When a teen has a chance at redemption, can he find his way back or remain forever cursed? 1973. 13-year-old Matthew McKenzie struggles to fit in. Unable to come to terms with his father's passing five years prior, he tries to sidestep unwanted attention from violent bullies by telling little white lies. But when a fistfight lands him on the brink of death, he is shocked when he finds himself hovering outside his beaten body in the company of an overly friendly spirit. Pipiera avoids change at all costs. As assistant to the head gatekeeper of an ethereal kingdom, She's less than thrilled when she's sent to Earth to aid a traumatized boy headed down a dark road. But when a supernatural rebel interferes with her job, 
the bright-eyed being fears she'll blunder her mission. As Matthew feels the pull of adventure from his suspicious new friend, he worries that he may never be able to right all of his wrongs. And as Pipiera continues to fail to influence Matthew, she finds herself caught in an adversary's web of deceit. Can Matthew and Pipiera steer clear of the trap and reach the path of enlightenment? That's the back cover for The Gatekeeper's Descendants from Johanna Frank. Get the cover, full back cover description, and of course the purchase link by going to the show notes for this episode 100 or by going to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. Zach, I discovered the source of my weird technical glitch. Uh, it was actually a frequency interference uh, from a strange package I had received. Don't know who sent it, but I noticed that the sticker on the side said that the return address is uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80995. Hmm. So I've already unwrapped this thing uh, so we don't get a bunch of rattling effects <laughs> over the microphone here. And I notice a strange effect about this device, this machine. I don't know if you look at it this way, see, it almost looks like a phone booth and like a red phone booth, almost like the TARDIS, but painted red. But if you step this way, it changes. It looks like a hot water heater that's been turned on its side. No, I, I mean, this is my bias showing, but that looks like a spaceship. Okay, I think we're supposed to get inside. And then what? Is there any buttons or something? It's dark. I can't find any lights. There's, wait, hold on. There's that one little button over there. It's a tiny red light, I guess. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Push the tiny red buttons are always, you know, you always got to push those. All right. Push the red button. Steven, I wonder where we are. I think we are in the Adventures and Odyssey recording studios, and I think I see Phil Lawler right over there. Well, here is Phil Lawler. He started his performing career at the tender age of five. He won numerous acting awards in high school and studied music, screenwriting, and directing in college. Phil then worked with Focus on the Family, co-creating the Adventures in Odyssey and writing more than 230 episodes, plus directing now more than 300 episodes. Phil also co-developed the hit comedy series Jungle Jam and Friends, the radio show, as well as the animated video series Little Dogs on the Prairie. Phil also served as a writer and consultant for the television series The Wubblest World of Dr. Seuss. Phil resides in Arizona with his wife and son, and temporarily we get to reside with him. So, Phil, thank you so much for joining Fantastical Truth for its 100th episode. 100. How about that? Boy, I'm honored. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, it's not nearly 1,000 episodes, which I think is the (laughs) recording count I saw for Adventures in Odyssey. Uh, That is almost as long as the anime One Piece, so it's just hit a thousandth episode. It's uh, it's very close. It's very close. It's interesting because uh, when we first started out with Hal Smith as Wit, and um, we were in Pomona, California, um, we had moved from Arcadia to Pomona, and then that that way in Arcadia, everybody was stretched out over seven or eight buildings, and so we moved to Pomona, and everybody was on one campus. And our Adventures in Odyssey recording studios shared a hallway with the Focus on the Family recording studio. So Focus on the Family Recording Studio was up front because it had a little gallery and and visitors could come and watch Dr. Dobson do his thing. You know, we were kind of sequestered in the back so nobody could watch what we're doing. But he had had his own exit. We We both exited into the same hallway. And one time they had finished a Focus on the Family broadcast right about the time that we finished our Odyssey recording. And so Hal Smith met James Dobson in that hallway. And we were all standing around talking and talking and talking. And and uh, one of the two, I don't remember which one said what to which one, but one of the two said, I hope we do a thousand of these. Oh, wow. And so well, we're almost there. Almost there. <laughs> yeah, I, wow. don't know, I don't know what that means, what God has planned after a thousand, but we're almost at a thousand. So, and it only took us, what, 35, 36 years. And yeah, then the whole world exploded. No, well, well, there you go. Well, let's, Maybe let's Odyssey did. Not. Maybe it'll or, be like the last battle and, you know, and everything. Well, I'll just <laughs> rake everything into the shadows and, you know, we'll. And then there's a platonic reality odyssey through uh, this stable door. 
Uh, no, Odyssey's been going on since uh, 1987, uh, starting out with the Family Portraits Test audio drama uh, done by Focus on the Family, uh, partly as a, re- as a response to the need for Christian-made creations. So, gentle listener, Odyssey may be a reason why you're listening today. It's certainly a reason why I get to do Lorehaven and Fantastical Truth, uh, because growing up, I got a hold of this audio series. It was originally on FM radio, you know, Christian radio stations, still on many FM radio stations, but now also uh, has taken kind of a podcast type form, but with its own uh, Odyssey app, the Adventures in Odyssey Club. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But in response to your question, where can I get Odyssey? Like I lost all my cassette players and all the albums. I don't know how to play them. <laughs> you go to the Adventures in Odyssey Club app and you can actually download the entire library of Adventures in Odyssey to your pocket. Nearly 1,000 episodes. The technology is extraordinary. Uh, and of course, uh, Phil, you've been more active on some of the social media now. Uh, there's an Odyssey fans club or two or six on the Facebooks <laughs> and places like that where folks oh, yeah. get to engage with you. And I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing some of your interactions there, uh, which is going to lead, like, before we get to our three chapter exploration through Odyssey's history, I wanted to do a quick lightning round with you mm-hmm. of questions that I've seen fans ask and that you have answered uh, in a very, um, uh, very shortened way. Uh, here's, here's the one question I've seen people ask, Phil, will Connie ever get married? And if so, why not have her marry X, Y, Z? Huh? 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 Your response, please. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, won't Richard, a bridesmaid. Ma- won't, won't Richard <laughs> Maxwell ever come to Odyssey and like, maybe he could marry Connie or, or what, what, what about that? Huh? No. What about Rodney Rathbone? He he gets he should get redeemed. Everyone needs a second chance, and he needs yes. to be a youth pastor or by the Timothy Center or ride on a motorcycle Wittend. or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rodney oh. needs Rodney needs Jesus. Is Rodney going to find <laughs> Jesus someday? Oh, good grief, no. Ah, <laughs> oh dear. Okay. <laughs> oh. Thus ends the lightning now, round with now, the Adventures you, of you Godfather <laughs> Phil Lawler. You can't just leave it like leave it like that. You got to give him a little bit of the background. Okay. So story. what's the, what's the background behind the no? Like what? Why the, the, so okay. negative? The background behind the no is uh, so y- y- there's different things for each one of those questions. Different reasons for the no. Story reasons. Questions. Yes. Okay. Story reasons. And okay. and you know for Connie, I've explained this actually on those sites as well. And one of the, one of the things I tried to tell everybody is I'm not just being obstinate here and i'm not just being okay well maybe i am a jerk but uh, (laughs) whatever uh i've explained it so many times that now i just resort to no no go back and read all of those other times i've told you exactly why we don't want to do that i've told you why we don't want to have connie uh, marry xyz you know i've told i've told you i've told you that over and over again it will change her character it will change the found the the fundamental character that connie is you think it won't but it will Look at Eugene. Look at how much he changed after he got married. That's this true. This is the way things work. It necessarily changes characters. That's a major life decision. You think it's not going to change her? Of course it is. You know, And then it probably won't change her in the way that you want to hear. It'll probably change her in ways that you're going, oh, wait a minute, Connie's so different. How come you've made her so different? Because she got married. That's the point. So... You know, things like that, major life decisions like that always change characters. And people think that's going to be such a real, really great, wonderful thing to do. And then, you know, okay, okay, well, we'll do it. And then like, well, how come that character changed? Why did you change that character? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah, you're, you're asking for a square circle. You're asking yeah. for a dry drink of water. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to work. Uh, I, I do look at that. I'm not sure if you've said this so much, but I do look at it as a as a wonderful reminder that God uses people whether or not they're married. You know, I'm sure. going back sure. to Genesis 2, marriage is good. It is a gift of God. Uh, it is how we propagate the species. It's how we're supposed to steward the earth in family units. But people can, of course, stay single as Connie is and do marvelous work for the kingdom. And she has been yeah. doing that uh, in Adventures in Odyssey at wit's end, you know, even when she was infamously frozen at age 16. And now that she is older and more mature and and right. going places, uh, her, I think last I checked, her uh, half sister was was living with her and uh, and. There's all yeah. kinds of amazing story yeah. directions that she can take without getting married. Exactly. I mean, I contrast, uh, contrast all the things that you said. You're absolutely 100% right about marriage. It's a God-ordained institution. We focus it's, on the family. Amen. A, it, it, <laughs> focus on the family. Amen. All, all of that. Agree with that 100%. But contrast that to what the Apostle Paul says later on in one of his letters where he says, if, 
If you're not married, stay unmarried. It's better for you to, it's better for you to not get married because when you get married, your, your heart is toward your spouse. Your heart is no longer toward God. It's toward your spouse. Right. How you, can you please your spouse? And I would just prefer that you stay unmarried. So, um, you know, and I, don't, I don't think that that's a, 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 a dictum for everybody, just like I don't know if marriage is a dictum for everybody. You have to, you have to um, take your own individual circumstances. And that's, that's what we try to do with audit. You know, now, the other part of this, of course, is, is uh, my Calvinistic leanings of saying, <laughs> I want, I want, I've created characters to be certain things. That's true. Vessels prepared things. for and, yeah, destruction. And, <laughs> and, Rodney and, uh, Rathbone is one of those. <laughs> I'm sorry. Rodney Rathbone is a non-redeemable character. He's just, and everybody just goes crazy about that. Just crazy about it. I'm like, no, you know, Rodney is, take it from just a story perspective for a minute. Rod, the nature of stories and what stories are. You have round characters, you have dynamic characters, you have full, rounded, three-dimensional characters. That's usually the protagonist. And you have static characters that don't change, that you don't know what their background is. You don't know who they are. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that if you, cha- if you do that, they no longer become the people that they are. They're functional characters to get you to do what you need to do to get your story to move along. Not every story, ha- not every character has a has a background not every character has that backstory that we have to know all about you know if we have interesting um, stories to tell about that that's fine we can do that but you know not everyone's going to be redeemed that's the way it works well and that's exactly what we see in the bible we we see the scene where jesus will wipe away every tear right and we, and we know that people will certainly miss other people that that don't make it to heaven and uh yep you know, that that's the very sad but true reality that, that's going to happen to all of us. And so I, I can appreciate that uh, artistically speaking and, and even theologically speaking, that it, yeah. it sort of prepares us for that future reality. It, it, it does. And, and what I find really interesting about it, though, is uh, we've had some recent things that have happened and some fan base reactions are really pretty amazing uh, and, and, and I think incredibly profound. Um, whereas where we have, for instance, we have uh, an Olivia uh, Olivia, one of our characters, a young girl, oh, the faith has crisis. a problem. The faith has a mm-hmm, faith crisis mm-hmm. and, and walks away. And, um, <laughs> and during the course of this, we started getting letters saying, I really need to pray for Olivia. And I'm thinking, mm. you're praying mm. for, what, who exactly are you praying for here? <laughs> what what exactly, you know, she doesn't exist. She's not real. Wow. Well, so I just sounds feel the kind need. Of, like, sounds kind of Catholic, like but okay. To, <laughs> I really feel the need like I have to pray for her. And I thought, well, this is really, really fascinating because, okay, it, it, are you praying that we will do, we will make, we as the writers and creators will make the right choices on her, the choices that you want us to make? Mm. Is, that, is that what you're really praying for? Because I can tell you, the episodes are done. We're not going to go back and change them. They have been predestined. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is all done. It's all written. Everything is done. Everything is written and produced. And I'm thinking, this is so interesting here. But, but all they of a empathize so much with this character. Su- yeah. But it also gives you such amazing theological insights into, into you know, just a small, small taste of what God must go through all the time. Because he knows what's happening. He knows what's going to happen. A million years from now, he knew what happened a million years in the past. He, he's, you know, he's out, he stands outside of all of this and he knows everything that's going to, to happen and, and go on. And it just, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is so, so mind blowing to me because I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is really, really interesting stuff here that we have going on. So, well, you have the, the power of the fandom. I mean, for a lot of people, particularly Christians, evangelical Christians, Adventures and Odyssey was their first fandom. I think that that's yeah. true of me as well. And then you have the internet come along and fans get connected with one another. And suddenly that power, that influence, uh, that confidence in that fan base grows exponentially. Um, particularly yeah. when, you know, some of the actors, writers, or you are interacting with the fans you know, suddenly you get uh, all of the ships storm into the <laughs> harbor uh, and all the people who've been shipping Connie with Richard Maxwell or Jeff Lewis uh, or, or, or Mitch, you know, all along, you know, or they, Jason or, or Jason, blah, 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 yes. blah, 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 or Rodney blah, Rath, blah, exactly. Or Rodney Eugene Rath. at one point and everybody. <laughs> oh, sure. Blah, 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 well, blah, blah. I always appreciate the I slap floor episode in the mid 2000s that just oh, completely sure. skewered the Connie Eugene ship. Uh, yeah. And yet I'm sure that you all, even in the early days in focus, I mean, you're getting letters from people the officer David Harley incident, you know, all of those things. And you also get people with what they feel are strong convictions about story and how you ought to treat figures of authority and all of that. And you, I'm sure like it's great calls for great wisdom. You want to respect the audience, but at the same time, 
I appreciate how Odyssey has gently challenged its audience, even while respecting them. And it just as the show has been growing and maturing for what is it now? 30, 30, 35 years. This yes. Is, yeah, it'll be yeah, 35, 35 years this November. Yeah. yeah. Well, that also leads us to uh, kind of our next bonus here and, and unplanned when we were talking about this episode, <laughs> uh, we had reached out to you in, I think, early uh, November after you and I met in Florida back in May 2021. Yeah. Uh, and um, Katie Lee was there. Uh, you were there at the, the Realm Makers bookstore booth at FPEA. And then after you and I were talking about doing this episode, uh, we had heard just before Thanksgiving uh, that unfortunately Will Ryan, uh, the performer of Eugene Meltzer and many, many other voices in Odyssey, including the aforementioned <laughs> Officer Harley. Officer and then, Harley, yeah. And then his sequel, Harlow Doyle, Private Eye. Uh, Will, <laughs> Will Ryan had, had uh, succumbed uh, to disease and had, and had passed. Yeah. And for Odyssey fans, you know, like, wow, this is really familiar because you were talking about Hal Smith, the voice of Mr. Whitaker, who died in the 90s. Uh, and several of the cast members now, Walker Edmonston and, and several others have since passed and their characters have sometimes also uh, died in universe. And yeah. I just wanted yeah. to ask you for your thoughts on, you know, Will Ryan and like, I'm not going to ask you what comes next. You know, that's that's for you all in the, in the creative team to decide. But uh, thoughts on Will Ryan, uh, 1949 to 2021? Well, Will was a, a great friend of mine, of course, and mm -hmm. um, I, I owe him a great deal um, as far as just my career um, period, everything that he has helped me with and um, everything that we've done together. Uh, he was a, a, very, a very, very good friend. He was there from the beginning, played so many different kinds of characters on, on, um, on Odyssey until we finally settled him into Eugene. Um, but he was he was a remarkably talented man, an incredibly talented man. Um, lived his life in a in a very creatively bohemian style. You know, there, well, that's for there sure. are folks who just the ukulele. Just uh, <laughs> yeah, there 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 are folks who just uh, who who just drip creativity, and you just feel like that's exactly what what Will was like. He he was was not a person who um, <laughs> he he was not a person who really understood the 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 what right side of the brain or the you know who is creative or the, or the left side he, he seems to have been a very right-brained right person from what i can he, see he was not a person who well it's just you mentioned the webulous world of dr seuss in the intro i he were we worked on that in the mid 90s and together and another thing that will got me involved with which was really oh, amazing okay didn't know that and uh he was out there and we worked together we were in new york and we worked together on that sh on that series and this is a this is this is a kind of a, a, a microcosm of the way Will operated. He loved to collect things. He was a collector, as a lot of creative people are. He collected pretty much everything that you can think of. And so we were on our way to a writers' meeting um, at the uh, at the Henson Studios, which is where the Over This World of Dr. Seuss was produced. So we were we were you know in New York. You know how long the long the city blocks are. They're not that long. I think we were on like 90, 93rd Street, and we had to go to sixty. Third Street or something like that. It wasn't going to take us very long. We had about a half an hour to get there, so we were walking down the street, and and Will gets a message, I think, on his phone that um, he said, "Oh, I'll meet you over there." And I said, "Where are you going?" And he said, "He said there's a a, a, a collector's store. There's an antique store um, that I need to go to. I want to pick up some posters." He was collecting Spanish language movie posters. Hmm. That was a big thing for him, really As high one quality, does. high class, you know, high quality posters. And he said, they have a real big collection over there and I need to get them. I need to, I need to go get some. And I said, okay, well, um, he said, just tell them I'll be a little bit late. And I said, well, where, where is this? And he said, oh, it's over on Central Park West. It's on the opposite side of the park. And I'm like, well, we're on, we're on East. We're on Central <laughs> it's Park It's just East. on the way. Okay. <laughs> it's, it, and, and we're right here. It's like, we're almost at Henson's and, and he said, oh, don't worry about it. And he, he gets a cab and he takes off. He just takes off to go and he doesn't. So the, so, you know, e even though we were in a creative situation, which was, which was, uh, the, the writer's meeting for the web of this world of Dr. Seuss, um, it's still a series. It's still a, the business part of it is we still got to go to the meetings. You know, you still, there, there's still that business aspect of things. Will, that meant nothing to him. That, that was, okay, well, I'll get there when I get there. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I'll get there when I get there. Because some other creative pursuit 
took his interest away from whatever we were happened to be doing at the moment. Just a little, and, just a little shiny magpie uh, thing going on there. So, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, uh, you absolutely want that, uh, that kind of creativity all around you. It can be very frustrating. I, uh, we, we did live shows all over the country, I, Katie and Will and I, under a little thing called the Fort Blanket Review um, stamp. That was our little company. And, um, and, and I ended up having to be the one to be the serious person. I had to be the adult in the room, you know, with both Katie and Will, because uh, I love them to death, but they don't, you know, when they just, Katie's gotten better, but, but boy, if they just wanted to go off and do something, they went off and did something. We, we did a show in Kentucky at, uh, uh, I don't remember, Southern, Southern Seminary, Southern, anyway, we did a show down there and, and. So it was time for us to go on stage. They came and got us, and I'm like in the front. I'm walking, and I I know that they're right behind me. Katie and Will are supposed to be right behind me. We're getting ready to go onto the stage. We're walking, and I'm talking to them, saying, "Okay, remember this, remember this, remember this." I turn around; they're nowhere to be found. I, I can't even. I'm like, "Where well, are you?" Spanish guys? language yeah. posters being distributed well, I, at a store on I, the Southern Baptist I, campus. No or? idea. I will go back and go, guys. We have to go on. We're getting ready to go on. They're talking to fans. They're, they're oh wow. Members. They're they're mm. doing their thing, going out and eating hot dogs and talking to fans and you know having ice cream and everything. I'm like, guys, that comes after we do the show, <laughs> not before we do the show. You're hurting cats. Oh, yeah. and, and try getting them to an air, try getting them through an airport. It's next. It's it's next to impossible. Wow, well, everybody's got their gifts, and because you, know, you just described the gifts, you know, being very, very, very right brained and maybe a little distractible, yeah. but you know, you've had the privilege of of you know being the the writer director, you know, as well as I guess I would say the godfather of of, <laughs> of Adventures and Odyssey. And it's great to get to know you and and Katie as well. But I wish I could have met Will Ryan as well. Um, so. You know, who knows? Maybe that'll happen someday. But well, I hope so. I hope I, so. I hope so too. Very, very hopeful. But let me just say, I I waited uh, to my shame too long to actually share the gospel with Will, mm. and uh, I I think I counted on just him being a part of Adventures and Odyssey uh, when I should have actually physically, you know, just gone out and shared the gospel with him. Um, and so I did. I, I was able to, and that's really good. And I think, you know, my hope rests eternal. I think that he is. I want to believe that he is, he will be there. Yeah. Well, you know? God is sovereign and I take comfort in that. And I take comfort in the fact that, you know, even if someone is a non-believer, they can be you know, blessed to be part of a creative endeavor like this that is shepherded by Christians. And yeah. then like Eugene himself, who went through an amazing, amazing, oh, yeah. long drawn out, appropriately so, conversion narrative from his introduction to his salvation in the mid-1990s as part yeah. of the Darkness Before Dawn arc. Yeah, that was worth the wait uh, because you you go through this this portrayal of a character who is surrounded by Christians. And one of my favorite lines is when Katrina, his girlfriend, has to break up with him and she tells him, I think that you've become so, uh, so embedded in this. In you've had just she says you've had just enough Christianity to become immune to its influence. Mm. Yeah, and that line and that concept has lodged itself in my imagination, along with many little, you know, lessons from Adventures in Odyssey throughout the years. And I now, I, that's how I view non-believers, you know, who hang around Christians so much yeah. to, you know, enjoy the glory secondhand, right. uh, but right. need Christ themselves. And, and that's always, always in there in Adventures and Odyssey. Jesus is always the heart of the show. You know, going along with that, though, I also believe that I think that we believers have shortchanged Christianity too much. Um, we have, we've made it into something else that it shouldn't be. I think we've, we've um, lessened the importance of it. And I think, I'm, I don't say that to, to try to inflame anything. I, mm. I, I just, I feel like that we, we haven't taken the responsibility of scripture, um, modern Christians, especially um, like within the 20th century and, and, you know, the last maybe 50 years, we've, we've become so used to it. You know, we've grown up with it. Right. So cultural Christianity, grown up with yeah. it from cultural, from culturally, and even uh, you know from from just a cultural standpoint, but then also all all of us who are in the church itself and have been and grew up in the church, um, we we uh, we became so used to it that we don't really realize how profound it is, mm -hmm. uh, how amazingly profound it is, and it's taking it's taking people, um, some some very 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 smart and and um, and deep uh, folks. And then some 
uh, who are Christians and then some who are non-Christians or that we don't really know if they're Christians or not, but they're approaching it from a different standpoint to remind us how unbelievably profound and rich and deep um, the, the scriptures really are. The, the stories the stories in the scripture and the scriptures itself really are. Um, a Jordan Peterson, for instance, who would take yeah, on... That, that's the, what I was thinking of. Yes, <laughs> chapters from, from the secular chapters. vantage, yes. When he tells, yeah, when he tells, when he goes through the whole chapters of Genesis and Exodus, he goes through all those things. He's, he's approaching it from a completely different standpoint. He doesn't shortchange the spirituality of it at all, at all. But he also says there's so much deeper spirituality. It really reminds me of Lewis again, you know, deeper magic from beyond the dawn of time. He's, he, and, and he's one who is searching out that stuff. I mean, he, he doesn't have all the answers, but at least he's looking for them. And that makes somebody like me who grew up and went, wow, why didn't I ever do this? I grew up with this. I grew up with all of it. Um, in my family, and never did it until now. I, I thank God that I'm, I'm uh, you know, still around in a time when people are really, really doing more of that. Um, and then, of course, you've got you know Doug Wilson up in Idaho, and you've got some people who are who are who are in the Christian community already who are also doing the same things. And you realize, wow, uh, there's forgive us, Lord, for taking you know for trivializing the deep, deep meaning of of Scripture. How deep this really is! How amazing this this really is! I mean, the words that I'm saying right now don't do it justice. It, it's impossible for it to do it justice. Uh, but may we may we search deeper and deeper and deeper. May we keep doing that uh, because it's so important. It's unbelievably important. And and I think that uh, you know we're suffering now from a. a, a a great deal of people who are walking away or people who are just scoffing at it and people who are, who are because we haven't taken it seriously. It, it, it was, it was the too easy grace, whatever that, whatever, oh, the whatever cheap that grace, was, yes. the, cheap, the cheap grace, you know, of it. Um, and, and, and that cheap grace, that's fine as far as it goes, but, but, uh, you know, I, I want to be more like Kierkegaard. I want to be that knight of faith. I want to go further than that. I don't want to be stuck as the ethical Christian. I want to go deeper, 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 deeper. Uh, personally, I, I would like to, and I hope that uh, I hope that others want that as well. It is re being reflected in a lot of the stories that we're doing on Odyssey right now. That kind of thing is really being re reflected um, in in several of the stories that we've been dealing with lately. So, um, and you know, and uh, to be quite honest, we we do get pushback from from the audience because this stuff is hard. This is not easy. This is hard. You have to grapple with it. You know, that's, that's the, that's the profound nature of the story of, of Jacob wrestling with the angel. You know, why is he called Israel? You know, he's called Israel because Israel means our, you know, contend with God. You contended, you, you grappled with, you wrestled with God and you came and you prevailed. And so I'm going to call you Israel. I think Dennis Prager says something about this. He got a call in one of the, on his radio show one time from a, a, a Muslim lady. And he, I was just she wanted the him, comparison. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he wanted she wanted him to say what is the difference between between Islam and Israel, and he said, "Okay, I'll tell you right there. That is the difference right there. Islam means um, uh, submission, yeah, submission, submission. Yep. submit to God, yes. and Israel means contend with God." And he said, "That's the difference right there between the two. We're we're oh, it's okay to grapple." with these things and we have to grapple with them and we need to because they're, because like I said it's hard this is not easy this is hard mm -hmm. exactly and yeah. I think yeah. great great christian made stories help us undergo that struggle i mean it, it's it i think you said a moment ago that uh, it's difficult to reduce uh, the the epicness of the gospel of christ's redemption rescue narrative for his enemies making them his adopted daughters and sons like it's difficult to reduce that to words but it does start with words you know it starts with the doctrine of the word of god you know the gospel yeah. as written inspired by god you know inerrant in its original forms but then christians also can reflect those gospel truths and beauties with art with storytelling you know with fantasy with drama uh, and and that is where I think you know a, a franchise like uh, uh, Adventures in Odyssey comes in is it is echoing back uh, the truth of the gospel uh, with with song you know with yeah. with acting with this kind of drama you know and not just simple salvation narratives but one thing that I've always appreciated about Odyssey is that a character can get saved like Connie did you know pretty soon after she was introduced you know her 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 uh, redemption process there at least leading to her praying the prayer with Mister Whitaker. Yeah. Uh, is is fairly short by comparison, but then you get more than 30 years of her growing 
and deepening her knowledge of the scripture uh, and yeah. confronting life challenges and having her role change and all of these things, you know, that go beyond just the call to conversion. Uh, and then you realize that the rest of the struggle of the Christian life is just as, if not more interesting uh, right. than, than the altar call as dramatized. And some Christian stories, I think, will stop with the altar call, you know, just like a romantic comedy may stop at the altar and they all live happily yeah. ever after. The most interesting, uh, the most dramatic stories are those that happen after those moments. And well, yeah, I, I, I agree with that a thousand percent. That's, this is very much like, um, this, is, this is akin to the whole question of why haven't we gotten Connie married because it's going to change your character. But this is, a, this is really interesting that we take, we think that the most, like you said, we think that the most dramatic moment the most uh, incredible moment of each of our uh, stories is the conversion moment. And that is, I don't want to shortchange it. Those are really, those can be incredibly yeah. dramatic. Well, it's a miracle. On the other You're hand, re regenerating a dead heart to a living heart. Absolutely. That is a miracle. You're bringing dead bones back to life. This is exactly what the, what's going on in that. And, 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 <laughs> and, but on the other hand, you've got a conversion like C.S. Lewis, who said, who said basically, I, I can't tell you exactly when this happened, but I know that at the beginning of the motorcycle ride, I didn't believe in God, and at the end of the motorcycle ride, I did. And there was no me, you know, uh, lightning hitting me or anything like that. And that's that's a those are are just as deeply profound in terms of conversion moments. But the idea behind that, the, the idea that that is it. Now you've reached the apex and everything else is like bland and downhill from there. No, 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 no. And I, I just had a conversation with Dave Arnold earlier in the week and I was talking about this very thing in terms of Odyssey and, 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 and you know, storytelling um, in general. And I said, you know, we, we can't forget that the title of this program is Adventures in yes, Odyssey. Yes, yes. It's adventures. And that's the operative word here. And I remember very clearly early, early on, um, when we first started working, uh, doing the program and putting it out there, uh, talking to people, and th they would ask about the whole thematic elements of what we try to do. And I, and I said, I want people, kids especially, but everybody to understand that the Christian life is a grand, the best adventure you can ever go on. Amen. It's, Amen. Uh, it's an amazing adventure. And, and we, but we don't, we, but we try to minimize it. <laughs> it's an amazing adventure, but we want to make it safe. And why do we do that? Why? No, there's an adventure to be had out there. This is better than the army. It's better than the armed services. It's better than going off and, you know, skydiving. It's better than having that kind of a gung ho. I'm going to go be creative. You know, I'm going to go do things in the world. It's better than all of that. All of that. All of that. They, none of that can even hold a candle to the truly adventurous Christian life. And, uh, but, but, and so, so I was, and so I was really gratified to hear going back for just a second, Jordan Peterson say something like that, just like a year and a half ago, mm. he was saying something he was, he's been talking about uh, to, to many uh, religious uh, figures. He's been talking to priests and bishops and whatnot, uh, interviewing them. And he says the exact, he said that, but he cast it in the light of, why has the church lost its mission, its, its, its message? A lifetime of service, a lifetime of searching for meaning is the grandest adventure you can ever go on. Amen. Ever. Mm -hmm. and, and that the church doesn't use that. So you have all of these young people who are, the church is bleeding young people. They're just leaving in droves. When he said, this should be the thing that attracts them attracts young people, attracts all of these young people to this incredible life that you can live, this life of searching for meaning and searching and service and helping. And, and who wouldn't want to go on that kind of an adventure? And I thought, wow, he is, he is absolutely uh, stunningly correct. Yeah. And why we have abandoned that, that message, I have, in, in favor of platitudes. Yeah. That, that's what gets me. You know, we've, We've abandoned that message in favor of, well, God really just loves you and he wants what's best for you. And, and, and that's exactly what you said about, we want to play it safe. And, you know, yeah. my, my tribute to, to Eugene's character is that the show never played it safe with Eugene. The, the show could have played it safe by him getting saved right away or, you know, preaching the gospel at him and then he disappears because he doesn't believe it or that he's just accepted and everyone's nice and everyone's kind and inclusive and loving. And, you know, and those are the excesses right now in the, in the modern church that we either 
go too far to the truth end of the spectrum or too far towards the grace end of the spectrum. And we, we, we have to have both because Jesus embodied both grace and truth. Right. And, and then, and it takes a process, you know, but and, we, but, but I feel like we've exchanged both grace and truth for niceness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. The idol of niceness. Uh, the niceness, the niceness thing. You know, I, I think Wilson, Doug Wilson says that, said that the besetting sin of modern Christianity is niceness. Right. We've got to be nice. Everybody, everything has to be nice. You can't offend. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then there's an overcorrection too, where you see some Christians get tired of niceness and they decide, okay, well, let's be mean. You know, and for <laughs> yeah. some reason, a moment let's ago, I just pictured, Christ. I pictured an Earth <laughs> 2 version, you know, a parallel dimension of Adventures in Odyssey where Eugene turns into the atheist college professor. And then at the end, he gets hit by a car right before the Newsweek, <laughs> <laughs> right before the, the Newsweek, the Newsboys concert. Oh, uh, no, 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 no shade necessarily in evangelical movies there, but no, <laughs> we're, we're grateful for that realistic, drawn out so, process that, where Eugene is seeking and... It's very realistic. What it, it's it's so funny that that you even mentioned that because uh, I'm I'm a I'm a <laughs> I'm a philosophy major. Okay, so I was ah, I, I majored okay. in philosophy. Mm-hmm. I have two I have two degrees in philosophy and other degrees in other things. But when I even saw that, I, I haven't seen either any of those movies through completely. But I saw the scenes, the pertinent scenes that everybody was talking about, and I'm like, the person who wrote this has never been in a philosophy class. <laughs> Oh. It's exactly the opposite of what that, that class is conducted. The class that they pre- depict on the screen is exactly the opposite of what a philosophy class is actually like. Yeah. Well, Eugene a was a philosophy class. Is actually Eugene like, was so. you know, is, is a philosopher. Mr. Whitaker is a philosopher. I can now, you know, you can see that influence then throughout Odyssey, mm-hmm. but not so much that it removes the story from audiences enjoyment. Uh, Eugene also, by the way, uh, you know, I guess we're all nerds here, but Eugene to me as a, you know, as a pre-adolescent, whatever you call it, like Eugene made <laughs> nerdiness fun, all of his big yeah. words and salutations. And, you know, I, I'm sure that sure. there are thousands of listeners who felt the same way. I don't think y'all ever even called Eugene a, a, a geek or a nerd, uh, except in, in mockery, but he just personified that and the inventions and the computer programming and like Eugene's just a all purpose nerd the only thing he's not nerdy about is popular culture uh yeah. which is an area where connie runs rings around him at least when it comes to <laughs> classic popular culture you know it's, it's what's interesting about that to me also is a favorite recent show that i've i've i, I actually haven't watched the whole series but uh, when it first came out i thought i really like this show it's the big bang theory and and uh i thought oh my goodness this is this is connie and eugene we mm. did this we did this you know 10 15 20 before years it cool. before yes. it was ever cool yes. With Connie and Eugene, we didn't have them be, you know, be romantically linked, but we cer- certainly had them be. She's totally into popular culture. He and, and surrounded by by four guys who are who are ultra ultra smart and are dealing with science and technology most of the time and are nerdy geeks. You know, I mean, that's what they are. And and so all they know from popular culture is is their their specific <laughs> their specific engagement with it, which is. Which is you know Star Wars and Star Trek and 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 so I I I just relished in that program and then I realized they're also doing some of the scripts that we did so they had when Sheldon couldn't drive a car oh we really? did that episode See, I never watched yeah. it but yes license to drive in the 90s. we did that episode 10, yes. 15, 20 years before they ever did it and I'm like I'm looking at this going home did they want did they listen to that episode because it's almost exact <laughs> I'm like wow that's that's mind blowing to me. So, um, uh, I, I just think it's, it's interesting how we, um, when you, when you've been around as long as adventures and odyssey have you, you, you start out, I'll, I'll be very candid. You start out by, <laughs> by mimicking the things that you like. So you, so you're, you're, you're trying to be like, uh, the shows that you really loved. And then pretty soon you take on a personality of your own. And, and, and then before you realize it, um, suddenly you start hearing other shows and you realize, wow, that sounds really familiar. Where did <laughs> yeah, that come yeah. from? Oh, oh, wow. So, it was me. It happens. That perfectly set up uh, chapter one of the grand adventure here of our discussion. Chapter <laughs> one I've called Adventures in Originality. Eh? Ah, 19- there you go. And it, like approximately 1987 and 1991, these are the first you know, three or four years of Adventures in Odyssey being on FM radio and then just, just taking off course i mentioned earlier that focus on the family had originally started this because they'd done a couple of test dramas uh, with chuck bolte and hal smith were in some Mm -hmm. of those for the focus on the family broadcast in the late 80s 
And then this becomes a full-fledged audio drama, which you helped to create, originally called Odyssey USA, which you harkened yeah. earlier to the, the, the new title, Adventures in Odyssey, uh, being much more broader appeal and then focusing on the adventure. I'm just curious, you know, I mean, we can go as long as we like here, but you've already mentioned some of how the show ends up going so right and avoid some of the pitfalls that could be common, not just to a new story world like this, but also to uh, a story world that is you know, made by Christians because some Christians will just turn up their noses and go, oh, that's, that's cheesy or that's fiction. What's <laughs> the point of that? Uh, or, or it does end up being cheesy and, and Odyssey ends up being, as I've said, you know, original, uh, maybe mimicking some stuff at the beginning, but then very quickly growing into its own. Like how, how did you all manage to create this kind of world and hopefully avoid some of those potential drama pitfalls? Uh, I, I think that we, there were, you know, there were only four of us who were working on Odyssey for, for the beginning of, of its time. Uh, Steve Harris and I uh, sat down and created the show together um, after Family Portraits. So we, we worked together on Family Portraits. Um, and then uh, we took everything that we had learned from Family Portraits. We, all, all we, we did uh, surveys and whatnot from Family Portraits. We took everything that we, we had learned from that and spent the rest of 1987 uh, revamping it to come up with um, to change it and, 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 and focus it, narrow, narrow the focus of it, narrow the scope of the target audience and things like that. Come up with other characters, come up with the town, come up with everything, which I, which I did, and then launch it. And Steve, Steve was wonderful at that. He was really great at, at, uh, at starting new projects, but Steve was in charge of the special projects division at Focus, and he had a lot of other things on his plate. And then he, then he also was starting his own business at that time too. So he was doing a lot of different things. And, um, and then, so, so we had to, we had to bring in another writer that was Paul and then Paul um, McCusker. Yes. Paul McCusker. And then, um, we had to bring in, we had Bob Luttrell who was the, who was a, uh, the sound engineer, the first sound engineer. And then he needed help too, because he was, he was the only one, uh, uh, Steve had done some, some production on Odyssey early in the early days. But then again, his duties took him elsewhere. And uh, so we need another one. So Dave Arnold came on after that. And, and he came on about, about a year into the program. Um, so it was really just Dave and Paul and Bob and myself for, for a long time. And it was a monster that needed to be fed. So, I mean, that's what a series is. The original mandate for the series was um, they, they wanted a daily uh, oh and, dear! And he said we we cannot we cannot do a daily. If we do a daily, it's going to turn into a soap opera. It'll only be fifteen minutes long, and the first ten minutes will be a recap of what happened the day before. <laughs> so there's just no way that the we three can minute do this long on a daily theme. basis. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so they said, well, if it's not that, then it has to be a weekly. And we said, well, I said, well, uh, you know, we're producing what is essentially a half hour television series here, just without the visuals. And the writing of that just takes time to do. And, um, you know, a television series, a television season at that point, I think it was 26 episodes. And I said, they, they go 13 weeks, um, you know, of writing. They go, they go the first 26 weeks and then they take time off. <laughs> and then, then they come back in and do another. So they don't do all, uh, they don't work every single week. They're, they're doing a lot of, they have some break time in there. And uh, they said, well, we really think you should, you should do a, a weekly, a weekly. They, they wanted it to be a weekly. And so, with no no breaks, no nothing, a new new episode every week. We never ever did fifty two. The most we ever did was forty eight. Oh wow! We did forty eight episodes, original episodes in one year, um, and most of the time it was in the thirties. I think uh, for those first few years, we did about in the in the thirties, thirty two, thirty three, thirty six around in there. But it was just a monster that needs to be fed. You have to have you have to come up with something. And I personally kind of like that better than what we have now. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but Just the reason why is because now <laughs> we have we have uh, we have 400 you know we have uh, we have 24 episodes that we have uh, every every you know to a month um and half of those go on the club or club originals and exclusives and half of those are are new episodes that go on the regular rotation and um and sometimes so so because of the limited amount of that the the i i'm i am somebody who likes the urgency of it I mean, that kind of gets deadline my driven. juices going. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm kind of deadline mm -hmm. driven. Same, yes. Um, I, I ignored the deadlines, but I'm kind of deadline driven. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> Theoretical deadlines. So, Which was the author yeah, that said, all, I love they're, deadlines. They're out there. I love I the sound they there. make as they wish past. They wish by exactly, head, yeah. exactly. Yes. Um, but uh, but I, I, I really, when I look back, I really, even though it was a lot of work, and it was a lot of pressure, I really loved the idea that I could walk into my office on Monday with an idea. And I knew that by Friday it was going to be recorded. Wow. Wow. That's a speed and then, process. That's and amazing. then by the following Friday, it was going to be on the air. Wow, so it was awesome. that kind of, that's, that's the, that's the production schedule that we were having. We were just like, boom, 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 boom. So that's a two week turnaround. About. It's just you originally. It's just you and Paul McCusker doing all yeah. the writing and uh, doing all the yeah. crediting there. Uh, this yeah. episode was written and uh, written by Phil, uh, Phil Lawler directed by Paul McCusker or vice versa. Or, well, it was the vice versa. Yeah, we would do, or it was written directed by Phil Lawler and written directed by Paul McCusker. If Paul was out of town, then he would write them and I would direct his shows. Um, and he would direct some of mine right. as well if I was not available. But um, so, you know, the, the, the way that worked was, was we didn't have a whole lot of time to, to quite frankly, to um, deal with audience feedback, you know, what the audience wanted. So we were creating shows. I mean, whether that, whether the story is true or apocryphal about Lewis and Tolkien talking about stories and how, what kind of stories they like and how come there's this, this dearth of stories that, we like and we like and we like and one of them said to the other, you know, the only way that we're going to read the stories that we like is if we write them. And I think, well, that really kind of played itself out with Paul and myself. Um, we we didn't have a whole lot of time to go through uh, letters and stuff. We got them occasionally, but we didn't really hear a whole lot from the audience. We we had a whole department that dealt with that, you know, at Focus on the Family, the correspondence department dealt with that. And we would get letters occasionally, but not that often. And so we were just writing stories that we wanted to hear. Well, you and see some of how that worked. You see some of the perils now in modern fandoms where the feedback from audiences is instantaneous over social media. And then yeah. suddenly, oh, wow, you know, 70 percent of our fan base wants these two characters that become romantically involved. So I guess we've got to have Oliver, Oliver Queen and Felicity in the next season. And then uh, yeah, then other fans yeah. push back. And yeah, there can and be hazards spoiler alert. It's just a Twitter bot farm in Russia. I'm telling <laughs> yeah, you all that. Yeah. probably. Yeah, it's, it's all it's all fake. It's all astroturf. So, I mean, speaking of social drama, you know, the first few hundred episodes. Of, of odyssey this very very tight cast of you know narrowing on that mm -hmm. audience the primary audience as, you, as you've said is ages 8 to 12 but not limited it's yeah. a good starter place you know for you to be at least age eight and able to engage with this level of drama uh lots of lots of um, little arcs going on like uh, there was the original dr blaggard comes to odyssey arc and you know oh, Connie's yeah. salvation of course um, with some exceptions, you know, Odyssey starts off being very much uh, contemporary. You know, it's definitely some whimsy. You know, Odyssey, you never know where exactly in the U.S. it is, just somewhere in the Midwest. But then, you know, and this is the part where I really enjoyed and was formative in my enjoyment of fantasy. Uh, Odyssey starts going more fantastical. You know, we've known from the beginning that Mr. Whitaker uh, is this, you know, philosopher, publishes an encyclopedia, uh, you know, strong Christian war veteran, all these things, but he's also an inventor and mm -hmm. he invents uh, not just a, a flop of a machine that was meant to cop, uh, photocopy in the first episode, the, I guess the <laughs> person, the wits flop, you know, very ironic theme there. Oh, this whole thing could flop, you know, <laughs> but then you can turn it into a pizza oven. Uh, but wit then makes a um, environment enhancer, which helps yeah. bring in the historical fiction, you know, the biblical fiction. And then, of course, the kingpin of Mr. Whitaker's inventions. We've already heard at the Imagination Station. I'm just curious how you all of the creative team managed to get in those fantastical elements, you know, working in not just contemporary social drama and moral lessons, but sci-fi and fantasy and even a little <laughs> horror here and there when you find a skeleton <laughs> in the secret room. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, as far as the as far as the imagination station and episodes like that are concerned, um, Christians, of course, have a real bugaboo about time travel. So we don't, you know, everybody thinks mm -hmm. I went I went full bore with time travel on Iliad House. I'm like, I'm not I'm not disguising this thing. If God is the God of everything, He's the God of time too, and He's the God of time travel. So he, it's all in His hands. Um, and I don't I, I'm not afraid of that as far as a Christian theme is concerned. But yes. um, so we, but the first episode that we actually dealt with that kind of thing was, uh, the day independence came. Ah, uh, yes. And Irwin Springer. Was, <laughs> we had when Irwin Springer uh, got up on a chair, slipped off the chair, bumped his head, knocked, got knocked out. And he was really into the revolutionary war, uh, you know, the war for independent, American independence. And uh, those guys were all his heroes. And so I really, I really just wanted to do an episode about the signing of the declaration of independence, but how do you get into it? What are you supposed to do? How do you get into it? Well, 
Connecticut Yankee. Connecticut Yankee court. style. Yep. Same kind of thing. <laughs> Knock a bump on the head, then he goes back and he experiences this adventure and then he comes out of it. And of course, you know, <laughs> later on we had Jimmy Barkley fall out of I had Jimmy Barkley falling out of the Wonder World treehouse and he cracks his skull open and 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 you know it's it's touch and go with him. It was a very serious situation with him uh, when he goes through someone to watch over you was that episode. But here, Erwin Springer knocks himself out, and when he wakes up again, they're like, "Oh, this is. Did you have a nice have a nice little rest there, Erwin? <laughs> you know, yeah, I had this great adventure." So I'm thinking, well, we can't just have kids knock themselves out whenever they want to go on an adventure. <laughs> what would the so how do we do this? Think? What are we supposed to do here? So yeah, so so I thought, well, okay, what's an adventure? And that was where the environment enhancer came along. That that was the first the first kind of um, step in that in that direction. And uh, it was Connie. Connie figuring again. Again, how do how do we figure out how to to show the episode of David and Goliath, and uh, how do we make that real? And that was Dave Arnold's, I think, first episode where he really got into the sound design of it and, and did such a fantastic job. I really loved what he did with that the sound design. But then from there, it was like, okay, now now what? Now now what are we going to do? You know, how does this all how does this stuff all work out? And uh, so we had a lot of talk talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, and we thought. We thought, well, what we really want to do the next the next great uh, historical religious historical event would be the crucifixion of Christ, crucifixion and resurrection. How do we deal with that? What are we going to do? That's a lot of and, bumps uh, on the heads to get there. That's a lot of bumps on the heads uh, mm-hmm. on the head. And so we, um, you know, we, we we talked it out and and went back and forth and batted around a lot of ideas. And then Paul uh, said, I, we should do something like this the imagination station. And then we debated on that and debated on what it was and how it was going to work and what it looked like. And what, you know, the whole, whole, we never did agree on what that early imagination station looked like. I always thought it looked like what it looks like now, which is basically a room. Um, you know, you walk into a room and, and, uh, it, and then it opens out onto, you can, you can walk around and, and be in it as a virtual reality. Room. It's a holodeck basically. Uh, the Star yeah, Trek TNG holodeck. holodeck. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yellow and, tape uh, on the walls. Exactly. And, um, but he always thought it was more like, no, you're sitting like in the cockpit of a helicopter. You're sitting, you know, if you were to, if you were to look in on somebody having an imagination station adventure, they'd just be sitting there doing nothing except imagining. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but you got doors, you got windows, you got people walking around, you got stuff is happening. How are they going to run? Is it all just happening in the brain? If you do that, why do you need this helicopter? Why not just, you know, put some electrodes in the brain, you know? So we we debated back and forth and back and forth. I don't think we ever actually came to a consensus, even though there's a lot of artwork back the, uh, from the early days of, about what they think it looks like. Um, but but that was the beginning of it. That was the it was uh, we we decided to launch it with the grandest the greatest uh, story ever told. Uh, we decided to launch Wit's greatest invention with the greatest story ever told. So um, that's how that came about. And and then from there, of course, the technology. I decided uh, we decided. That if Wit has this capability of using this kind of technology, you can use it in other ways too. So that's where you know the the room of consequence came about, and that's where the um, the inspiration station, I guess, came about. And so there, oh, yes. there, a lot of the other um, uh, the other inventions that Wit uh, later on perfected were that those that, that was the genesis of all of those those kinds of things too. Well, I'm so glad really that trying that to t- figure out exactly what Wit would do. Who Wit was? He was this enigma. I always thought Wit is the Aslan of Odyssey. You know, he is. Yes. He is, yes. He's he's good, but he's not tame. You know, and I've been really dealing with that a lot lately. And boy, have I got a lot of pushback on that one. Mm. Well, uh, Mr. Whitaker represents a lot of things to a lot of different people. You know, the 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 perfect Christian. And but I always appreciated that from the very beginning. You know, Mr. Whitaker had his flaws. Like even in the oh, origin yeah. story of him purchasing uh, the Wits End building, you know, and oh, then yeah. just not really caring much for the small town or this old building, you know, and that's him later in life, you know, uh, oh, yeah. teaching at the college and everything, you know, in this, in this small town. And then his wife mm-hmm. dies. And then you, you just, you kind of get the idea that uh, Jenny's passing leveled him up in biblical maturity, even more than he already was. And then you know, him becoming this grandfatherly figure to these kids, you know, serving them ice cream, you know, from this position of humility. And of course now, you know, it seems he's going on a mission trip every other week. So he's got, he's got time <laughs> to spare. It's amazing how he's able to you know fit all these things into his busy schedule, but it, it's, uh, it's kind of wish fulfillment and yet also realistic at the same time who, who Mr. Whitaker is. And then, you know, going back to being portrayed by Hal Smith through the mid nineties and then by Paul Herlinger, uh, from the, yeah. from the mid nineties onward. Uh, now being portrayed by um, 
Andre Stoika, if I'm pronouncing yeah. that correctly. That's right. That's yeah. correct. Yep. So yep. You know, Mr. Whitaker is regenerated a few times, only it's a vocal regeneration only. It's still the <laughs> same hero. Uh, he's got yeah. the same backstory and the same uh, spiritual faithfulness. And of course, I appreciate you know being uh, him being the heart of Odyssey, that same emphasis on the truth of the gospel, the truth of scripture, as well as imagination. You know, Mr. Whitaker taught me not to let my imagination run away with me. And by the way, right. Phil, I used to think, oh, this is such a corny uh, uh, moral to learn. Like, why, why are they teaching me? That? Like, it doesn't sound very biblical, you know, and then, you know, why is beyond my years at age 11, you know, <laughs> now at age, nearly age 39, I think what a valuable moral lesson that I was privileged to have learned. And while I wish that many Christians would learn that lesson, especially when we're watching the news, don't let your imagination run away with you. You must discipline it. Sure. Yeah, it's a gift. Uh, God gave us this wonderful, incredible, magnificent, like every other gift that He gives us. He gives us all of these wonderful gifts, and uh, and 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 we, you know, because of our sin nature, we corrupt them, we we abuse them, we do bad things with them, and um, and and so part of what we want to do with Odyssey, part of what we wanted to do with the Imagination Station uh, episodes, part of what we want to do with just the regular episodes that we teach, the everyday life episodes, is. Um, how to properly how to properly use the 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 gifts that you have um, that God has given you um, how to recognize what they're the good ones from the bad ones how to recognize all of that stuff to like what you're supposed to like and to dislike what you're supposed to to dislike uh, which is a really interesting um, that, that's something we've completely lost in this in this uh, in this woke age is is recognizing recognizing bad things as being bad. Right. Discernment. You know, yes. Discernment. Mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that this is what, you know, uh, Aristotle said that education is, uh, the purpose of education is to get you to like what's good and to not like what's bad. But you have to recognize what that is first. You know, this, it all boils down to that. That was, that's a really interesting, uh, simple, but really interesting and profound statement when you think about it. We don't teach that anymore. We don't teach anything like that anymore. Schools never teach you to recognize bad things as being bad and good things as being good and to, to seek to seek after the good things schools don't do that at all and and i dare say a lot of churches don't do that either you know we're not we're not we're not engaged in that at all and so um again these are conversations that that dave arnold and i specifically have had about odyssey and the direction that odyssey is is trying to go in now and uh, you know we call this we call this critical thinking Mm, that's you know, amazing. How, how do you develop those kinds of critical thinking skills? Which is why a lot of the episodes that I'm doing now have these great classic moral dilemmas in them. And and again, people push back on that. I mean, this is why you don't have a whole lot of philosophy majors anymore. They don't they don't that have to deal with moral dilemmas. You have to deal with understanding ethical moral dilemmas and and, and what you're supposed to do. How do you even recognize them? How do you recognize what they are? And uh, that, that's like a basic thing. And then how do you deal with them beyond that? And uh, people don't like that. They don't, they don't like to have to think, but it's so important for us to know how to do that. Very important, especially for kids. Well, it's one of the, sa the safest, almost, well, not safe, but the most, one of the most secure ways you can encourage that kind of thinking is through drama, is through asking those questions, yeah. not yeah. of the gentle listener, but of the character. You know, if the moral qualities right. are happening in universe, then the rest yeah. of us are looking, at, uh, looking in from outside, you know, with, from that position of security, and then we can start thinking through, you know, simulating, going on our imagination station yeah. adventure, uh, yeah. wondering, well, what would I do? In well, that, I, in that it's interesting. I have a character, Renee, Renee Carter. I she's like Renee. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think she's I a club exclusive, character. isn't she? Yeah, she's a club exclusive. Mm -hmm. We may, we may be. Well, I can't say anything about that. But okay, um, okay. <laughs> but the uh, but I love Renee, and one of the reasons I like Renee is because she actually is dealing with this sort of thing, and she comes right out and says it. Mister Whitaker tells us that you know, look, your ethical. Uh, decision making is a muscle like everything else. It's got to be worked out. You got to. You have to learn this. Stuff. You have to practice this. This has to be practiced. Uh, the episode that the club is featuring right now is called Dickensian Dilemma, and that's exactly what she tries to do at the end of the Dickensian Dilemma. She's trying to present Emily and uh, some of the other characters with a with a, a, a dilemma, a moral dilemma that they have to solve within the context of like a Dickensian uh, adventure, and. Um, and it's it's really important to, to to do that. But she says, you know, and 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 Wit then sa says, what else are these inventions for if not to be able to do that? You could do that in a safe way. I can put you in a seemingly perilous situation, but we know, okay, I know, obviously, in in the imagination um, station that you're not going to actually die. 
in this situation. So if you have, for instance, if there's a, a classic moral dilemma of uh, saving one person, of sacrificing one person to save a whole bunch of people, you know, well, let's, 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 let's play that out. How do we do that? Let's play that out in, uh, in, in these episodes and see what, what decision you would make. If you were in that kind of a situation, what would you do? How would this work? Well, a lot of people just don't, they don't want to think about that. But yeah, but this is really important. This is really, you, you may not ever actually be in that situation, but if you, if you start practicing those muscles, using those muscles, you'll see how they apply in other similar situations in your real life. Oh, I love that you used a story to make an apologetic for story itself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, very, exactly very what you said. Yes. That one of the utilities of a story is to help us practice those ethical muscles. Exactly. And, and, and simulate decisions that we, that we might have to make or that could be similar to ones we have to make. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the last two years have, have certainly stretched a lot of ethical decisions we've all had to make in the church. And I was reading a really good article about this last night uh, by Owen Strand, and he talked about how there were pastors at the beginning of the last two years that were ready to go, that they mm-hmm. had already decided how they were going to face this situation. And then he said, and, and it's taken some others some time to catch up, and that's okay. Yeah. Like, we're all passing the test that God's given us. but. It, it occurred to me that so many people were uh, way ahead of this at the beginning because they had practiced that imagination right. of, of saying, this is the line I've already drawn in the sand. Yeah. Um, and so I, that's exactly what stories can help us do. It, totally, totally. And, and it, the interesting thing is, you know, going back, uh, a lot of the early episodes that we did, uh, I, I, love, I love them all, but a lot of times we would give everybody the answer. We would give, you know, we would set up the moral dilemma. We'd set up the whole thing in story. We'd have it play out completely. And, and here's the verse that you can turn to in order to be able to get, you know, the satisfaction that you need in order to be able to answer the question and whatnot. And um, I think what happened is a lot of kids listened to that and then went out into their regular lives in the, in the real world. And they came across a similar situation, tried it, and it didn't work because that was the limitation of story, right? So you have story sure. and it works in the story because we crafted the story that way. But in real life, things are a little bit more unpredictable and you can't really deal with it. And so a lot of those kids then grew up and said, well, wait a minute, I practiced this. I did what you said and it didn't work. And so I'm now very skeptical of all of this. And I think that that caused a lot of them, not just Adventures in Odyssey, but a lot of other things that they saw happening. Because this, this also happened in the context of churches. Mm-hmm. Those mm-hmm. kids grew up, they went through their teen years, they became young adults and said, you know what, I, I don't think this is actually for me. And they left and went somewhere else. This is why a lot of churches were bleeding people for a long time. They just, they just the, great, the great evangelical spring that we had yeah, back in the 80s, the big, huge, you know, we were, yes, moral we were majority. in our glorious, yes. our glorious time period back in the 80s and early 90s. Those, they all grew up and then went, nope. And they all fled, you know everything came crashing down for a variety of reasons. So I thought, you know, what, what, what do we need to do here? How do we need to adjust? What, what are we saying? Well, we're, we're giving them the wrong message. Let's not give them four. Let's give them two plus two and have them get to four. Yeah. Well, it takes wisdom, not just a knowledge of good yeah. and evil, but also knowledge of wisdom. You know, the, the yeah. heart of the Bible is formed by not, you know, not just uh, epistles or narratives or genealogies, but wisdom literature, you know, for exactly. God's people then as well as now. You got the Psalms, which are a celebration of drama yeah. and crying out to the Lord and wondering why, and then, you know, praising him to the skies as you dance into the temple the next moment. You know, that's that's the art of the Bible. Then you also have Proverbs, which are working through these ethical scenarios. And yeah. Proverbs used to frustrate me so much because like, <laughs> what, what's with all these generalized statements, you know, but, but they, the, the, the purpose of it is to encourage, you know, the, the saint, uh, the, the person who's a member of God's kingdom to be thinking through these things and imagining them. Uh, and I call that, uh, well, actually, let's just go on into chapter two here, Adventures in Maturity. You know, you've already yeah. hearkened to Odyssey's more recent past, but I, I still see, you know, starting in there in the, in the early nineties, and then even working up to, uh, the early 2010s, you know, uh, some efforts, you know, to, you know, they were like, there were some efforts to, uh, shorten the shows, you know, to make them more whimsical, more kid friendly, but then there were others that were maturing, uh, the, the storytelling. I don't mean mature content, you know, don't, don't misunderstand, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, violence or anything like that. But you did have characters, you know, Mr. Whitaker and Connie and Eugene dealing with some very realistic scenarios. And then the kids in Odyssey as well. You know, mm-hmm. so, some episodes are still pretty simple, you know, um, 
Robin Jacobs shouldn't cheat on a test. You know, that's right. that's pretty straightforward. Don't cheat on the test, folks. <laughs> uh, but then others, like, for example, you know, you're you're a college student, you're dating a non-believer and it's Eugene yeah. Meltzner. What do you do? And some of those don't have easy answers. And uh, I, I'm just curious, like some of the, the creative process there, um, especially with actors changing, you know, because I meant to say, too, of course, you know, Hal Smith mm -hmm. died, mm -hmm. you know, during the production of the show. And then you all have to scramble. What do we do with Mr. Whitaker? And I would say that probably that was the high point for me. Uh, the first time that a character experiences a kind of death on the show, you know, spoiler alert, yeah. Mr. Whitaker didn't die. He just had a sudden <laughs> missions opportunity in the Middle East, you know, and so he's going to be off there, you know, in, in a sandpit digging for things. But it's still a kind of death, you know, and the wisdom that you all practice, speaking of wisdom, in kind of signaling that that w was what had happened and then treating it like a grief, because it was, it was a grief, a separation oh, yeah. from the character. Oh, yeah. But not killing Mr. Whitaker, which I think would have been in retrospect, the wrong decision, but would have been justified. You know, still it allowed me and many, many listeners to kind of work through those things in that fictional environment and then prepare for a very difficult reality in our groaning world, which is the reality of suffering and death and separation. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it, uh, we, we labored a lot over that. We, we agonized a lot over whether we, um, wanted to have wit die. Um, because for one thing, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of practical things that went into that. I mean, how are we going to find a voice replacement for Hal Smith? I mean, he, he was very distinct. He was a voice. unique yes. voice, and it, it was going to be very difficult to find that kind of a replacement. How are we going to do that? And um, but then, and then, but then, on the other uh, hand, there was this is this is this is a crude way of putting it. I really don't like this analogy, but it's a good way of putting it. He's he's Mickey Mouse. He's he's our Mickey Mouse. You don't kill Mickey Mouse, you know. <laughs> That you, is true. You, you make him a symbol. You make him a symbol. You may not. You may. He may not be going on his own adventures anymore. But you make him a symbol. He's still the very, very present anywhere you look at Disney. You know. Um, so, so we, we had to we had to go back and forth and try to figure this out. And we were really pretty much uh, we, were, we were pretty much like I don't know if we're ever going to find this voice. When Chuck Bolte got a call from somebody who said, "Man, there's somebody up here in Seattle who sounds exactly like Al Smith. You ought to listen to him." And that was Paul Herlinger. And, uh, and yeah, he, he sounded a great deal like, like how, like how, but he brought his own sensibilities to the character too. He brought his own, his own sensibility. Somebody said that, you know, Hal was like a, Hal's, Hal's wit was, was like a, a brilliant grandfather and Paul's was like, um, a much sterner version of <laughs> a brilliant grand. He, he just felt much more stern in the way he handled things. He didn't laugh as much. He didn't, he wasn't as jovial. He didn't joke around as much. And that's probably true. Um, you know, but but he was playing. He was making the character his own, and that's exactly what Paul did, and he did a great job. You know, or even early on, we 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 still dealt with death, um, like you said, in the case of the secret room or the episode Karen, where she yeah, dies Donna Barclay's cancer. friend dies, yeah, uh, and then and then had to re deal deal with the repercussions of that, and um, you know, so we had some serious, even even things about uh, you know the the price of freedom uh, episodes like that, where we had early on discussions about heavier weightier kinds of of things or the underground railroad um, trilogy underground railroad trilogy mm -hmm. we had a lot of a lot of different episodes that really kind of kind of dealt with um with with meatier subjects so uh we didn't want to shy away from any of those i mean it was all story 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 what we didn't realize this i now realize it and teach it everywhere i where wherever i teach uh, but story is everything that's all there is this story and we need to tell either really good ones or not good ones, <laughs> you know? And so it's incumbent upon all of us. I think, um, we're all walk and talk and stories and we're all part of everybody else's stories and, and everybody's a part of our stories. And, and, uh, uh, that's all we, that's all we got. That's all we have. We, that, that's who we are. And that's why, um, uh, it, it's incumbent upon all of us to know what the nature of story is. What, what is it? What, how do stories work? What, what, what what elements make a story a story um and we're so busy with living with our lives that we don't understand how how each of those little things that happen to us during the day is another chapter in the story and so many people get stuck in a rut uh you know in their lives where they think that bad things are happening and i'm never going to get out of this and and you think no this is just a chapter in the story don't you understand what happens next in the story mm. stories are stories are great um 
because of what happens next. What happens in the, the next? You, you're going through a bog right now because you're going to go on to the mountaintop next. And when you're on the mountaintop, you're, that's preparing you to go through the next bog. Uh, that's the nature of stories. It's the nature of the way things work. So I, I hope that that's part of what we've been doing on Adventures in Odyssey too. I, I really want everybody to understand the nature of the adventure, the story, you know, the magic of life around us. Um, we don't recognize it as magic because it's just, we see it happen every day. But, you know, when you stop and think about it, <laughs> that was, that was part of our maturing process too. Is to, uh, ironically enough, it's, it's, you're maturing by actually going back to those things. We talked about this earlier about, you know, you'll be old enough again to read fairy tales. So we're maturing by actually kind of doing the retro thing of going back and taking a deeper look at mythological, fantastical, fantasy, story, uh, you know, fairy tale type things uh, that show us uh, how to live. How, how, how we how we are supposed to live, uh, how God wants us to live, how we're supposed to live, and so it's it's um it's it was a very very interesting process. I mean, I, I mentioned magic a minute ago, and everybody just gets real nervous when you start talking about well, that's, that. That's but, the M word. Yes, yes. Well, it depends on how so, you understand so that. Nervous, it but fictional but yeah, or it, occult? Yeah, there's difference. It's 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 totally it's black magic and 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 good magic. There's good magic and dark magic, and 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 we you know we 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 don't recognize it as magical because we see it happen every day. We're used to it. But I mean, think about it. We get, we, we put 200 people in a tin can and fly it through the air. <laughs> uh, we don't call that magic. We call it because we know how it works. And my thinking is just because we know how it works, does it works, doesn't make it any less of a miracle. doesn't make it any less magical. We, we now think nothing of getting into an automobile and driving 50 miles one way to go to work in some cities to do our busy work day and then driving 50 miles back to go back home. You know how long that took a hundred years ago? Yeah. 150 years ago. You know how long that, that, that was, that's like, that's, that, if you brought somebody from that time period to now, they would think you're, you're all wizards. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't we, why don't we recognize that for what it is? We should be recognizing it for what it is. We should be recognizing it for, um, for the magic, the type of magic that it is. These are the other biblical illustrations. This is part of, uh, of digging deeper into the scripture. We don't think in terms of, uh, we, we live in this world that real magic happened. You know, it has happened. It's all throughout scripture. And I, I mean, I'm sure you've heard these, these illustrations before where Moses takes a stick and throws it on the ground. Oh, yeah. the, the first wizard duel in the Bible. The first wizard duel. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the Pharaoh's wizards, he had magicians, court magicians, and they understood the magic of the day. They weren't calling on God. They understood the physics of the situation and turned their sticks into snakes too. Yes. The narrator okay. doesn't try to go over. He doesn't try over. to say. He, just, it, he yeah, uses the nope. same words. Yeah. Boom. Uses the same exact words. It's a mystery. Words. How did they do it's, it? How the, did they do how it? How did they do it? Yeah. How did they do it? So... Um, uh, we, we have, we have this whole, you know, idea that we got to stay Oh, We can't talk about it that way. You can't talk about it in terms of that. We can't talk about it. Jesus changes wine, water to wine. He changes water to big vats of water. He changes into big vats of the best wine ever. Yeah. But that happens every single day here. It just happens slowly. That's true. He just sped up the fermentation <laughs> he process. He just sped That's up true. the fermentation yes, process. He just sped it up. Yes, but it happens every day. Why is it less of a magical thing? Because it happens over a period of six months or a year versus happening instantaneously. It's still the same magic. It's still yes. unbelievable magic. We've got these 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 little these little pellets of flavor that grow on a vine somewhere, and we take them and crush them, and crush the juice out of them, and let that sit for a, a while, and then it gets it has it goes it goes a chemical change, and then the year from now it's like, oh, this is great wine. Okay, Jesus just did it like that. It's the same process, just sped up. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, we, we live in a world filled with this. Miracles and magic are all around us if we just open our eyes and take yes, a look at it. Exactly. And, and it's an odyssey as well, you know, whether or not you call it magic. Uh, the, right. the sensibility is there. And yet also, you know, especially for listeners who may not be familiar with Adventures in Odyssey, I wish to point out, as I've kind of hearkened to uh, earlier, uh, Odyssey's story is warned against undisciplined use of magic. You know, right. there, was, there was even the two part, you know, uh, let's just call it a Dungeons and Dragons episode, you know, the, the yep. big bogeyman of the 80s. But um, Odyssey <laughs> handled it with sensitivity. 
And, you know, yeah. you got Dr. Dobson at the beginning, you know, doing you know, kids. I'm, we're going to talk about uh, these fantasy <laughs> role playing games. <laughs> And That's pretty good. You, you may got him down pretty good. Laugh a little <laughs> bit at at you know the seriousness, but the episode itself, you know, first it's in a family context. You know, it's yeah. it's the Barkley family, uh, and then you have the cousin from out of town who obviously has something else going on. And to him, yeah. this magic is dark magic because he is trying to use it to control his world. Uh, right. He is working against the emperor's magic, to use Aslan's phrase, uh, and exactly. trying to hijack it for his purpose, which is exactly. the occult use of magic forbidden by Deuteronomy 18. Uh, but then similarly, you get, you know, I'm jumping forward a few years. One of my first episodes, is the two parter, a touch of healing, mm -hmm. where Odyssey now working within the confines of Mr. Whitaker, no longer being in the show, brings in his son, Jason Whitaker, a portrayed by Townsend Coleman. The Yay. Tick. I love The <laughs> Tick. I, I love Towns' performance. Uh, thanks, Citizen. Uh, he takes the Imagination Station, realizes, hey, we can use this to basically heal people because mm. it's all in your imagination. So you can put a, a, a child in there who has, uh, has to use a wheelchair, and then suddenly he can walk again and participate in the adventure. And then, of course, you know, this young man doesn't want to come out of the Imagination Station. Right. And right. then at the same time, Connie's grandmother, we talked about shows that explore death. You know, Connie's grandmother is near death and there's some family drama there. And like, that's that type of mature storytelling, you know, that is, uh, that is even back then in, in the nineties, it doesn't end with an easy moral. You know, Chris right. Anthony comes on at the end and says, there are a lot of Christian views on healing, you know, but here's one thing we can know for certain. And you hear me quoting it, you know, I'm, I'm this nerd. <laughs> I'm remembering this to this day because these are formative lessons. Yeah. And then even there, even just the phrasing of, you know, Christians have different views. I'm like, well, I appreciate that. You know, I'm not growing up the sheltered evangelical kid anymore. You know, someone gave me a little idea inception there from the very beginning that Christians have different views about this and that this is normal. This is expected. Uh, the right. mature Christian is going to expect this going forward. And I yeah. don't think that just a book of words could have communicated that idea nearly so much as hearing this, imagining this, you know, in the theater of the mind being played out by characters whom I've yeah. come to love and respect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the book of uh, words that, that you're talking about though, if we, if we haven't done a really good job over the years of making people understand how great of a story that is, you know, how, how, how you need to be able to translate what you're reading there into terms of story. And that means you need to understand story. And it doesn't trivialize it to turn it into a story because, again, story is everything. Story is the most important thing. Um, we, 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 uh, we, need to, we need to really understand how all of that works. And we don't, um, we don't do it. And, um, <laughs> and it's too bad. It, it really is too bad. But Hopefully, we're going to start doing more of it now. Hopefully, um, folks like you guys uh, who, who grew up and still want to maintain all of this, um, maintain your interest in all of this, um, and, and, and then pass it on to the next group and talk intelligently about it, which is really, really, a, a, I'm very impressed with all of this, the intelligent well, talk that, um, that, that we have. Uh, people are, people, we are taking it more seriously now, and we need to take it more seriously. We need to understand the right way of looking at this. and. Uh, and I, and I hope I, I, I'm glad Odyssey has been a part of that. I hope it can continue to be a part of it in the future. Oh, amen. Uh, from your mouth to God's ears. Um, a phrase <laughs> occurs to me now, too. Um, I mean, John Piper writes a lot about, I guess it's yeah. his phrase, the dangerous duty of delight. And, you know, growing up, you know, more of my college years, you know, some of his writing has also been very formative in understanding uh, the reason why God has created us, not just for duty and obedience and holiness, but for all of those things for the purpose of ultimate eternal happiness in him. Yeah. That's where I see the connection being made is that, oh, delight is a duty. You know, this is our, as in Christ, this is our destiny for eternity. And stories and artwork and culture making and all of those things are part of that. You know, even going exactly. back to Genesis 128 yep. with the culture. That's mandate, the adventure. That's that is the totally adventure. the adventure. Yes. That's and what we need to be talking about all the time. That's exactly. what we should be thinking and doing all the time. That's the adventure. That's, that's, that's what makes this the best adventure ever. Yes. There we go. There's, there's the money quote right there. So from there, let's go to chapter three, which I've called Adventures in Legacy, uh, the period uh, roughly covering 2014 to the present. And I, I just chose 2014 because uh, that was when uh, you all launched uh, at the time and had a different name, but it's now called the Adventures in Odyssey Club, which is the streaming app 
where you need to go if you want to get Adventures in Odyssey going all the way back to the family portraits in 1987. You can start from episode zero and then trace it all the way to episode 900 whatever. And you can see just exactly how uh, this original series has matured and now built this uh, built this legacy of, of Christian made drama. Uh, Phil, I'm curious, uh, like how much you are a part of this, where forming the the process of jumping to the streaming app generation. Mm-hmm. You know, Odyssey is still on the radio. You know, some stations air it daily, uh, going back to the archives, uh, and then I imagine some still get it weekly. But yeah. for me and now thousands of fans, uh, we're listening to it uh, streaming over the phone. You know, this. <laughs> This sure. miraculous seeming device, you know, possibly built by Eugene in his spare time <laughs> where you can have all the episodes there. Whereas before, you know, if you're a kid in the early 1990s, you have to lug around your cassette player and a stack of albums. Like, right. A boom box, a big, huge boom box yes, on your shoulder. Yes. And turn it up for the Imagination Station takeoff <laughs> parts. Uh, somebody may have done that. I don't know if that was me, but so, so now that it's a streaming app, like what are some of the challenges now, uh, well, know, logistically uh, as well as story wise? Yeah. I think that uh, one of the a big challenge that I see is is really just logistical uh, more than anything else. We have so many ways now of delivering this product, and we use them all. And I can't keep up with it. Quite frankly, I I'm, I don't really have a whole lot to do with how we distribute the program anymore. How how it it gets out to the to the audience and the listeners, but um, I I just know that there's there are some difficulties <laughs> with with how many ways there are to how many ways that we have to distribute the, that we have to distribute the program and how many ways um what we have to do in order to make that happen and uh um so the the app came along because it was inevitable uh, you know as technology progresses as technology as new things come along in technology um it, it's a tool like every other tool and you can use it really well. Well, you can use it really badly. Um, and we decided this is the way that uh, things are going. This is the way that people are wanting to listen now. Um, we haven't gotten to the point um, where I think we, quite frankly, part of me says what we ought to do is uh, make all six episodes available in, a, in any kind of a new album. Make all six episodes available at once and let them binge. And then they just have to wait for the next one they're they're not quite there yet they're you know they're they're, they're the rest of the, the rest of the team is not quite uh signed on to that they still like to release them one you know one or two at a time uh depending on what's happening but um again i i part of my brain is still back in the old school of well we've got a we've got a radio program and it's a monster that needs to be fed so we better get get going and 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 i need it i need it to you know i need to get this thing done so we can get it out by in, in a couple of weeks that has changed a lot I think it's changed the nature of how we do programs. It's changed the nature of how we write programs. We don't have the urgency, quite frankly, that we had uh, in the past because we have fewer programs to produce now. To me, uh, you know, once again, this is just me. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but to me, we've lost kind of that excitement of uh, that that real thrill of I got this thing here and I've got it written and it's now as we're going into the studio and recording it. Um, there, there are a lot of times, quite frankly, that you'll, uh, one or more of us will complete a script and it'll be nearly a year before we actually record it. Um, so there, there's a disconnect between the time that we finish the script and the time that we're actually recording. Several weeks will pass, sometimes several months, and in some cases a, long, a lot longer than that. And, um, and so now I have, to, I have to figure out how to get that excitement back about this, you know, because I've moved on to other things. My brain is no longer where it was there. And I got to get back and go, okay, okay. How, how do I get back that assi- excitement? And uh, and that's a challenge for me. That's been a big challenge, I think, more than anything else. Um, I, I know that principally they wanted to make sure that we have enough lead time for the production guys to be able to do everything that they want to do uh, on the programs, and they're fantastic. They're they're you know brilliant at what they do, and I would never want to change any of that. I do I do frankly kind of miss, like I said, the old days where it was really really fast and fast paced. We could get it out, get it going. And, and as a consequence, one of the things that has changed is we can't be as current with, uh, with uh, current affairs. We can't, be as, uh, we can't be Johnny on the spot. If something happens in the world that we really think we need to address, chances are we're not going to do anything like that because by the time we get it into the pipeline, it's going to be more than a year before what we're dealing with now actually gets on the air. And so things like the Y2K um, situation, 
Oh yes, uh, where we the did YAK it. problem. The YAK <laughs> problem. Nineteen ninety nine. Yes. Know, um, where we where we actually dealt with that as it was happening. Um, we couldn't do anything like that anymore. Chances are we wouldn't be doing anything like that at all, because again, it's the production lag. It's the it's the timeline. I could write a script about something that's happening tomorrow. So so uh, so to to be an example, somebody said uh, uh, you guys ought to do something about COVID, and I mentioned COVID in passing as a pretext for an episode that was happening. Yeah. Something was was, was happening that the, the, the pastor who caught the bug that was going yeah, that around? Was, that was a, the yeah. episode called The Simple Reminder. Yeah, and he good, said, good you know, timeless touch there, I thought. He, yes. just, he just put that in there, but it's, it's not anything that we can, that's going to tie it to this time period necessarily. Um, and, and you can do vague, vague things like that, but we really don't address current events very much at all because by the time we get them into the production pipeline, um, they're going to be passe. They're going to be gone. And and why do them? Why why even address it? And it's kind of going to have been an interesting spiritual lesson for us too, because then again, we're looking at you know what what happens next in the story. What what, how, what is the nature of story? What's really important here? Why are we, we we may think this thing is important right now, but a year from now, it's not going to be all that important. So you know, let's deal with the important issues. Let's deal with the things that are timeless. Right. Um, so we we that that has changed some of the stuff. I think that we're really looking to. Um, find ways to maybe increase the amount of episodes that we put out. Uh, I mean, I, I don't make any of those decisions. I would like it if we did more episodes, um, but we have lots of other stuff that's coming up. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're dealing with our time judiciously uh, in terms of putting out episodes and things. But uh, I, I think the app is definitely the future. I think that, that uh, eventually, um, you know, again, I don't make these decisions, but eventually, I think that the the albums are going to fade away. We're not going probably not going to do those anymore. Um, we'll still release on the radio because there are people that we still have a very large radio audience. Um, but but really, I think everything is kind of pointing toward the app now. And um, and like you said, I mean, you can get all of them. You can listen at your leisure. You can <laughs> you get the most current ones, and you can get all all the ones from the past. Or you can go and back right to your there. You can, yeah. yeah, you can uh, carry them around with you wherever you go. Yeah, that's what I do. Well, Phil, my, as I mentioned earlier, my kids love the app. Uh, we, we gave them, uh, you know, old iPhones or whatever a long time ago. And, mm-hmm. and they've, they've been huge consumers of the show probably every night listening to one or more episodes, li- listening to episodes while they do dishes or chores or go on a walk. And so it, it's definitely become part of our family. And it, it's, you know, we talked about you, Eugene earlier. And so many of these characters have almost been like, uh, become friends to us. And, uh, you know, I, maybe I'm not necessarily praying for them, like you said, some of the fans are, but uh, they become so close to us. And I, I love that you guys took that step because when we first discovered Avengers and Odyssey, it was, I believe it was my, um, my mother-in-law that gave us like a set of the CDs uh, mm-hmm. years, years ago. And uh, okay, that worked for the car, but not for our rooms. Like we, we didn't really have CD players and uh, we tried to listen to it on like the DVD player with the TV and it's just weird. Yeah. doing that so the, it was <laughs> it was very much the natural progression and our kids uh latched on quickly and they even they even had some like feedback for the app team they're like oh man, you know they need to improve this or maybe add this feature or work out this bug or, or whatever and so they really jumped in now of course you know v- vr and the metaverse and all that kind of stuff oh, is, yeah. Is, yeah. is getting really real so you know maybe one day it's we're, we're gonna get box. a uh, yes <laughs> maybe one day we're gonna get a metaverse uh adventures in odyssey that would be pretty cool <laughs> Well, Mr. Whitaker's already had that technology and he doesn't even need the <laughs> the helmet. And as we've That's seen, right. there can yeah. be some drawbacks. You know, the giant yeah. corporation tries to take it over or Dr. <laughs> Blackard plants a computer virus in there and tries there to have go. eternal life. We're, we were so ahead of our time, weren't we? So ahead of our time. Well, <laughs> yes, indeed. To a fault we, <laughs> in yes, the case of the metaverse. Yeah. La- launching a, launching a, a, a terrible virus on the world, too. That's, 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 that's true. Our... There was a virus that was part of Dr. Blackard's plan uh, in the Darkness Before Dawn arc. I'm definitely showing my it's either, nerd we're, here. <laughs> we're, we're, either, we're either way ahead of our time or evil is just uh, uh, really predictable. Let's put, let's put it that way. Well, that um, is true. That is true. But a couple of things that have meant a whole lot to us. There was uh, a series of episodes that were about forgiveness, and and that definitely struck a chord with with one of our kids with some things she was going through, and uh, sh- she's probably mm-hmm. listened to a couple of those episodes in that theme multiple times, and it's it's really uh, brought some spiritual growth in her life that she needed to go Good. through, and uh, 
you know, they, they definitely touch on a lot of topics that eight to 12 year olds go through like friendship and, uh, uh, hard situations at school and man, mm-hmm. it's it sparked so many conversations. So I, I just, yeah. I totally appreciate it for all the doors it's opened to have, uh, excellent conversations with them. That, that's great. That's really wonderful. And I think and what I really uh, am, am, am very gratified to hear is that you're doing this as a family. Yes. Um, we had so yes. many uh, so many folks would write in um, and be upset if, if we did an episode about a, a controversial or more serious or more adult topic. How come you did this? Why did you do this? How come, uh, you know, my kids came in and they said this and they have never said anything like that before. And the first question that I ask them is, how come you're not listening with kids? Uh, how, yeah, how, yeah. Come, how come you didn't either listen to the episode beforehand or why aren't you listening with your kids? We are not a babysitter. Yes. This is Amen. not something that you need to put on and then walk away because it's all safe. Yeah. We're good, but we're not tame. Yes. <laughs> we're good, but we're not safe. Okay. You could trust that we're going to do the good thing. We're going to do good, but you can't trust that it's always going to be safe. We want to be the tool that you use, even things that we think that we're all going to agree on. There's lots of room within the framework of Christianity there and Christian belief. There's lots of room for different kinds of uh, interpretations of topics just within that. I'll give you an example, baptism. Mm. Uh, I did an episode early on about baptism, and boy, did I get we, did we get a lot of positive and negative feedback. Well, the homeschooling episode as oh, well. Oh, the homeschooling episode. Mm-hmm. Well, the homeschooling episode is kind of an anomaly because it was right at the start of the homeschool. I tell everybody this, this. Everybody goes, that's such an embarrassing episode. And I said, well, I, I used to be about embarrassed about it, but then I, I, I stopped and thought, well, I just went with what was available at the time. Right. I very did as early. much research mm-hmm. as I go. possibly could. It was very early on in the movement. And this is this is the only things that I could find. I I researched that heavily, and this that was more the best before I could the internet, it. folks. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so to, to try to say to try to say that, that that is representative of what it is now is is, is kind of is kind of silly. Yes. You may have had Mr. But, Whitaker's modem because Mr. Whitaker had a modem in the late eighties. You know, before yeah. it was cool, way before it was cool. But there oh, weren't yeah. a lot of web pages out there. Certainly exactly. not about homeschooling. Exactly. So. But again, I mean, we, there are going to be things that, that, that we're going to say uh, 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 that you may not agree with as parents. And so, or you may have a different take on it. Or you may say, okay, well, you know what? They did that in that family. That's the way that family approached things. In our family, here's how we do it. Here's what we say. Here's what we do. Uh, we don't celebrate that holiday in the same way that they celebrated that holiday on Adventures and Odyssey. Okay? That's not what we do. But by the same token, I also hope that... Um, that if there, if you come across an episode where there's a serious topic, the case of the secret room where they find a murdered body, you know, a Karen where you, a, a, a child dies of cancer, somebody who gets um, hit on the head and is touch and go life and death like Jimmy Barkley did with someone to watch over me. It, by the same token, I hope that you're not so scared that your kids are going to be traumatized by this, that, that you don't want them to listen to anything. No, uh, we live in a world, I mean, Lewis said it best, Lewis was, you know, said it best when he was talking about how we live in a world that is filled with bad creatures, bad, bad things, bad stuff happening. Your kids are going to have to face this sooner or later. Better to face it in a story. You know, if they're going to have, if, if they're going to have to, if they're going to have to fight dragons, at least let them have stories about heroes who fought dragons. So yeah, they let know them how know you this. can beat dragons. The, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That Christ, the dragon slayer has um, exactly. beat the dragon and, of sin. <laughs> And, and, that's, and, and you can be sure that's what we'll do in every episode. That part, the good part, is what we're going to do, but we're not safe and we're not tame. Amen. Well, it, apart from you know, fans who have their, have their ships uh, or, or have their you know, criticisms <laughs> with you know, homeschooling episodes from the early days of the homeschooling movement, uh, I've been blessed to go to several homeschooling conferences within the past several years now, uh, joining up with the Real Makers Bookstore and others, uh, and seeing the fandom. The, yeah. the absolutely positive fandom that Adventures and Odyssey has, you know, not just for the audio series, uh, but for the Young Wit uh, series uh, and many other. Uh, there's an Imagination Station spinoff series as well. Oh, yeah. And those are top sellers at these events. And then uh, I've mentioned that uh, you and Katie Lee, who plays Connie, were at the FPEA conference uh, May of 2021 in Florida. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you all are basically Stan Lee. You know, we've got Robert <laughs> Downey Jr. there and the people are lining up and then you know, Katie Lee starts talking and then you see the eyes go, you know, mind blown. Uh, what's going on? This is Connie. 
Uh, and for anybody, that would be rather overwhelming experience, but particularly for, you know, some homeschool families can be a little bit more, you know, sheltered. And yet, you know, this is their opportunity to engage this world of Odyssey, you know, this world that's bigger than themselves. Uh, and they love this stuff. And I, I'm oh, yeah. curious just what you all have, have, have enjoyed about getting out to some events like this and, and getting to meet the fans and, and getting to in, engage with them and find out Sometimes, as you mentioned, you know, the Odyssey fandom now spans at least two generations. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been uh, uh, wonderful, uh, 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 unabashedly wonderful, all of it. Um, it's, it's great to talk to the, the, the folks, the, the fans, the supporters, the audience, the listeners. Um, it's, it's remarkable to hear their stories and how Odyssey has affected them in their lives. I, I think God has so blessed that the program to be able to affect them in that way, and I, I you know, all the glory goes to Him. Um, we we had a 30 year um, anniversary cruise. We went on a Disney cruise, um, all, all of Focus Focus's 40th and Odyssey's 30th, and we they Focus got the whole boat and everybody came on board. A bunch of families came on board. It was like 4,000 people. We we had we brought a lot of the actors with us. We did a live show and we did a whole bunch of little events and whatnot. And um, during one of the breakout events, I had taught. A, <laughs> this, this is just, this gives you an idea. Uh, I had an eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, they wanted somebody to do a uh, uh, to give a lecture on writing at, at eight o'clock in the morning, script writing. And I'm like, nobody's going to come to this thing at eight o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't come to this thing at eight o'clock in the morning on a, you know when I'm on a cruise. No way. <laughs> The place was packed, and I'm like, "Oh wow!" I didn't even believe that anybody cared Nerds. about this stuff, but they came I in. I love them; they really wanted to. But but the wonderful thing about this would be there was a we always have a, a line of people who want to ask questions about us and who want to come up and talk to us and everything afterwards. And uh, ap after one of the breakouts, a, a, a mother came up; she had her two kids, and they wanted autographs, so we gave them to them and whatnot and everything. And then I noticed that she circled back; she had her kids go off and do something else. She circled back. And I got in line again. And when she came up to me, she said, I just wanted you to say, I wanted to tell you something out of my kids hearing. She said, I grew up in a family where I was abused in every way possible. Oh, wow. Mm. Mm. And she said, in the midst of all that, the only thing that kept me going was listening to Adventures in Odyssey. Oh, wow. dude. Wow. I, mm, I, can't, I, can't even, I can't even say this now without tearing up. I, I didn't realize that. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that until... The, the impact that the program can have on people and that's who it's reaching. I had, I had, I really honestly had no idea until that moment. It took 30 years, wow. you know, but I had no idea that that was, that God could use this program to be that kind of a lifeline to people. Wow. I had no idea. Praise God. 30 years of, of faithfulness. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan obviously, but you know, I know that there are challenges with this, you know, there are, I'm certain there are organizational challenges and yeah. budget challenges and of course, you know, fan challenges and cr just the normal creative process, you know, yeah. how virtuous do we want to be versus how challenging, you know, how, how adventurous do we want to be here? You know, yeah. I, all of those I'm sure are part of it. You know, I, I can only guess at how the sausage gets made and I'm sure it can get very messy <laughs> when you're just dealing with human beings, much less, you know, very Christian human beings, much less very evangelical human beings, much less very artistic human beings. Uh, and all of that stuff I'm sure is, is part of the process. And yet I'm, I'm so grateful even just to hear secondhand about that level of impact. Uh, and I, oh, yeah. I hope you just keep getting more and more encouraging feedback from fans, uh, along with people who are still upset about officer David Harley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get those too. We get those too. It's okay. You know what? And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I like everything. I'm iron sharpens iron. I really, I really like the critical feedback as well as the, uh, as well as the the, the praise, uh, again, it all all of it goes to God. It's all all to the glory of God, not not to anything that we 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 do. God has blessed us, and we are very very grateful. Um, it's all in His hands. It's all in His timing. And the only thing I would say about the criticism is make sure it's a justified criticism. Yes, <laughs> you know? biblical. Please be biblical. Yeah, yeah just just uh, don't 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 tell me something's cheesy. Yeah, that's that's highly subjective. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't know what I just don't know what that means. What does that mean? So you know, be, be a little more erudite with it. That's all. Right, right. Yeah, make the make the criticism biblical if you're going to at all, and then just realize that Christians can differ on these issues. Like you said, uh, there, there's there is some room for disagreement within secondary Christian tradition as well as uh, the creative world building like this. Oh yeah. Uh, 
which leads to my uh, bonus question. I guess it will unhappily draw to a close here. <laughs> what can you tell us is next for Adventures in Odyssey? As of now, we're a couple of months into the year 2022. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to break any news today? Uh, is there anything you can forecast that's coming up for our heroes? Well, I can tell you that we're working on uh, the Young Wit book series. The first book series is uh, five books. I'm working right now on finishing book five. Dave Arnold and I write these together, and Dave has done his part. And I need, I'm doing my part right now. So book four is finished. It's in the galley stages. I got to make some corrections on the galleys, and I'm working on book five. Uh, and I've got two more books in the Blackard Chronicle series that I'm also uh, got to get done. And so hopefully we're going. All those are going to be released this year. That's the plan: is to release all of those oh, this okay. year, uh, so that way uh, everybody can get the whole series at once. Um, I apologize that it's taken so long to do, but anything worth doing is worth doing well. That's happening. Uh, we we are obviously continuing on the the Adventures in Odyssey app. The Adventures in Odyssey Club app is having a complete revamping. Oh, uh, is it's going to be okay. brand new. Yeah, it's, it's being completely renewed and revamped. And awesome. so, um, in fact, all of, I think the, all of the whole focus on the family app and the, everything is being completely redone. That's going to launch this year too. That's coming up real soon. And we got some other things that I can't talk about right now, but uh, that are definitely in the works and uh, that have actually even been approved and are in the works, which is good. Um, and hopefully those will, will We'll talk more about those as we get uh, more into the, the producing and, and everything else of them. But uh, some exciting stuff is still coming up. We still got some tricks up our sleeves, uh, and we're going we're gonna to make the product available as fast as we can get it out. Well, fantastic. And, of course, the Blackguard Chronicles, uh, which are uh, kind of retelling and fleshing out the events of that original Blackguard saga. Uh, you, Richard Maxwell, stands out there. <laughs> <laughs> Come get more of your boy. There's a lot more backstory for Richard Maxwell. Uh, there is, yeah. yeah, including yeah. I believe his original friendship with Jellyfish. Yeah, Jelly. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. There's it a all, lot. All the, the, the the lovely thing about doing those books is uh, there are two two really great things. One, I uh, it's 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 very rare that an artist gets to go back to earlier work that they've done many years ago and correct all the mistakes. So oh, I, get, okay. I get to go back and correct, put fill in plot holes, and go. Okay, you know, there's this, there's this stuff that we couldn't couldn't include in the stories themselves because we ran out of time. You know, you have a half hour half hour to tell the story on radio and um, on audio, but on the book, I can actually flesh it out a little bit more. And then the second thing, of course, is is uh, is there's a there are always parallel stories going on with the other stories. So you have the main narrative thread, and everybody kind of knows what that is because that's they've heard it before. But now, all of a sudden, Wit has a de detour in here, and we don't know what happened to him during that time period. We know part of what happened to him during that time period, but we don't know everything that happened to him during that time period. And uh, I will say this, um, the Young Wit book series and the Blackard Chronicles are connected. Oh, they are. Okay. Okay. They are. So, so was so Mr. Whitaker going both. off to Dol Guldur to cast out the Necromancer or? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. We'll see. You have to have to read them once, once I get them written. You have to read them. But uh, I, I, I will tell you this. I think that the Young Wit book series just, uh, just you know, if I can, if I can <laughs> be so bold, uh, Dave and I both agree. I, I, I would really love to just take this, this thing and run with it and every media that we have I, the young wit book series for me has just been so much fun it's just great to to get this <laughs> to go back to the very beginning you know and uh, of, of of john avery whitaker's life and find out all these different things that happened and just the time period in which he lived and um, all the things that he that he did to become the wit that we know today um all the mistakes that he made and how how he he learned how to do the things that he did and how and, brilliantly precocious he was and you know if you read the young wit there's a, there was a lot of controversy over the rydell uh, uh the rydell stories i've seen some of that rydell. yes mm -hmm. especially how they ended up and especially with wit's explanation of uh of of to 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 emily uh basically she asked did you know did you know all this stuff was going on and and wit says yeah i did and why didn't you stop it and he says, well you know, I, I had I had to let it play out, and he he gives an explanation for for it. And part of his explanation is that I was allowed to do things when I was a kid. I was allowed to explore my own creativity. Oh, I was allowed wow. to explore things when I was a kid. And how I, I, you know you you all you three are very special kids. You you all have very special abilities, all of you. 
And uh, I, I was allowed to explore and examine my gifts when I was your age. How can I, how can I not let you examine and explore your gifts? I was there the whole time. I was watching over you the whole time. But I got to let you explore and examine it. Well, that, that's not going over real well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a scary it's okay. world out there. I get it's the okay. concern, but again, sometimes, again, yeah, you know, it's a matter of, uh, he's, he's good, but not tame, good, but not safe. There you go. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, we, we don't live in that kind of world and, and you've got to be equipped to be able to handle it. And we, we want all of our listeners to be able to handle the things that they're going to be handed because it's now blatant. We've seen it. We've seen it happening. I mean, yeah, just we're in a negative eyes. world now. We're exactly. in that world right now. And we've got to be able to have champions and knights of faith and knights of honor and raise our kids to be those kinds of people who can stand up to this stuff and say, no, I will not back down. Um, and that's, that, that requires them to practice. They have to practice it. Amen times 10. Uh, you can find the Odyssey Club, the Adventures in Odyssey Club at oaclub.org. Uh, you can also follow Odyssey on several of the social medias. Phil, are there any other ways that folks can keep track of your work or possibly come after you with their ships or <laughs> anything they'd like to do? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm around everywhere. So, you know, I'm on, I'm on, I'm, I am on Facebook. I think I'm on MeWe or whatever if you want to try to look me up on there. Um, you can just uh, write to Focus on the Family directly. You can send the e emails to Focus. I'll get them. And, uh, and true get, fans know the address. We get a lot more of them. We get a lot more of them now than we ever used to. We used to not get the letters, but now because of social media and email, we get a lot more of them. So. Yeah, that's uh, Odyssey, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80995. Or in Canada, right, too. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> true fans know. And true fans know the old Pomona, California address, too, which I will not utter here. I, I wonder if there's that forwarding address is still yeah, active do, I, <laughs> for those know, cassettes that, that are still out there. <laughs> that, that building is now, a, uh, that building is now a, a, a medical clinic. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So many things. I, so many things changed. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Bill, it's been great to have you. I look forward to keeping up with what's going on in Odyssey as well as your creative pursuits. Uh, and I can forecast something of my, I'm making, dare to make a prediction of my own. I'm guessing that due to the popularity of the Young Wit books and the Blackguard Chronicles in the recently opened Lorehaven Guild uh, platform on Discord, I'm guessing we will at some point have at least one book quest about that because so many Excellent. of Lorehaven readers love those books. And of course, you line them up to get them at the, uh, at the uh, event in Florida. And I'm guessing that'll happen again at some point as well. That, that was a real blast. I really love doing that. One of the reasons that I really love doing it, and I've done this now at a couple of other events as well, is uh, if you get the Young Wit books, there's a map of the town that he grew up in yes. on the inside covers. And the map changes with each book because it's all seasonal. So, you know, the first couple of books are in the, they have the, the trees are in full, full foliage. And then in book three, it's all snow covered. And then the snow starts melting in book four. And then we're back to spring in book five. But there are all these little Easter eggs in the map. So they're in the map, all sorts of them. There's just, and I always pointed out, uh, you know, the first, the, the one that I would point out uh, to all of the people who came up and wanted an autograph and said, look, look here, see this they're right here. See this little part? Ah, see, isn't that cool? You got to look at this map as you're reading, go back to this map and keep looking because there are all sorts of clues in this uh, Easter eggs and lovely things in these maps. Uh, and that was something that I remember as a kid when I used to read books. I really loved that and, and would go back and, and you know, just different kinds of books and would do fun things like that with the visual things like that with a book. And it's just, it just enhanced the adventure of the book. But, uh, so all sorts of really fun things and cool things coming up and, um, and especially with Young Wit and the Blackheart Chronicles book-wise. And uh, there are more Imagination Station books coming out, too. I know that they're going to continue those. So look for them. Watch for them. All right. And we'll include those links in the show notes as well. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. I hope not for the last time, but I wish you God's speed with the creativity. And as you as well continue to grow in the gospel, we're right there with you on the grandest adventure that our author could ever make. Best wishes to you, sir. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Stephen, that was an awesome conversation with Phil. Uh, I wish I could go back to the Imagination Station uh, room or rocket ship or whatever it is uh, as often as possible. But hey, I guess we can. And we can uh, listen to these episodes, practice our ethical muscles as we talked about, and uh, just go on some amazing adventures uh, by ourselves, with our families, with our friends. If you, our listener, have gone on an amazing adventure through the Imagination Station, we would love to hear from you. So please send us a note 
at podcast at lorehaven.com or tag us on social media. Just look for Lorehaven or come and join the Lorehaven Guild. We would love to have more conversations with you there. You can subscribe free to Lorehaven and join those monthly book quests. Of course, we also discuss the topics of every Fantastical Truth episode. You just go to lorehaven.com, get the subscribe pop-up, or go to lorehaven.com slash subscribe and enter your info there. Then we'll send you the exclusive insider link to the Lorehaven Guild on Discord. Next on Fantastical Truth, lately, many fans, I don't know any of them, but many fans have been yelling about Amazon's Rings of Power TV show and Star Wars, and Star Trek, also Marvel, and DC, and Doctor Who besides. We're doing a lot of yelling. What for? Aren't we fans of these fantastical franchises? Yes, but some of us are getting a little tired of them. Not only the fan toxicity, but too much content, too many worldly agendas, and possibly too little time to keep track of it all. But aren't Christians meant to engage our secular culture for God's glory and to build bridges with our neighbors? We believe this, Yet we may also fall into franchise fatigue. Our next guest, Daily Wire entertainment reporter Megan Basham, joins us to explore how we Christians can best respond to secular fantastical stories, even when they go woke. Meanwhile, Fantastical Truth is a production of Lorehaven. Today's episode featured special guest Adventures and Odyssey co-creator, writer, and director Phil Lawler. Our production engineer was Zachary Russell, and our executive producer was E. Stephen Burnett. And I am still, Stephen, hoping you'll join us again next time for more adventures in our odyssey to seek and find Christ's fantastical truth. 